Budget and Finance Committee, and the Planning and Zoning Committee to order. I want to thank everybody for coming, specifically Vice Chair Shulman with the Budget and Finance Committee, Chairman Bedney from the Planning and Zoning Committee and their respective committees. Thanks to everyone in the gallery for joining us today, and thank you to the MLS soccer team for making the time to come and explain your proposal to, this, to these gathered committees who will consider this entire proposed legislation over the next six weeks, along with the Council as a whole. There, have been, there has been much debate over this proposed change to the Fairgrounds Nashville so far, and as we look forward to hearing the details of these proposed changes this afternoon, let's all keep an open mind. Um, everyone has a stake in this. I think everyone in the room is a stakeholder to some degree, and it is important that we all listen to one another and honor each other and respect one another as we move forward in this conversation. At the previous meeting held on July 11th of the Codes Fair and Farmers Market Committee, we heard from numerous organizations that currently utilize the facilities on an ongoing basis. That meeting brought to light three main issues that we hope will be addressed today, amongst other things. Those three are providing adequate parking for all activities on the property, accommodating scheduling for all events on an ongoing and forward-thinking basis, and addressing any or any legal issues that this proposal may incur regarding the charter and or the 2011 referendum. With that said, I invite my fellow chairs to offer any open opening statements at this time. Councilman Shulman. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, uh, the fellow chair and uh, members of the council. So I'm, I'm glad to see uh, so many folks here. Uh, I think you said it well. Um, I would say that uh, on behalf of um, the chairman of the budget committee, uh, Taneka Vircher, who could not attend, she asked me to sit here. Um, and um, all I can say is that, uh, again, I'm looking forward to the information. We'll see what's provided. Keep um, an open mind and let's see where we go. And uh, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Bedney? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Is it on? It is. I'm going to have to speak a little closer to it. Like this? Thank you very much. All right. Well, uh, thank you, uh, everybody, and the Council for coming, the, our guests, uh, people in uh, watching on TV and back there in the, in the chairs. Thank you very much all for coming. Uh, uh, we had a, I'm the chair of planning and I'm a commissioner in the planning commission. We had a meeting uh, just this week to discuss just the rezoning on uh, 10 acres on the property. Uh, many of the people that came had a variety of issues that they wanted to discuss, but uh, we were only tasked with deciding a, a zoning issue. And all the commissioners agree, uh, me included, that the rezoning was an appropriate uh, used for that property. Even Council Member Glover, when he spoke at the meeting, indicated that he thought that it will pass. And it's, it's because we all understand that zoning, uh, it's, it's a separate issue uh, with the concept of what happens or not on the fairgrounds and that sort of thing. So just wanted to bring you the message that uh, we all agree at the Planning Commission that this was a good rezoning for the property and that it passed uh, unanimously. Thank you, Councilman Penney. Now that the introductions are over, uh, the way this is going to work is I'm going to invite the MLS team to come up, and how you guys want to structure this is entirely up to you. Please introduce yourself and give us a presentation, let us know what's going on, uh, and when you're finished, we will open it up for questions from the committees present. Mr. Wilshire. Is that you? Thank you, chairs. Is it on? Great. Thank you, chairs. Um, my name is Matt Wilshire. I am not a member of the MLS team, although I do have a strong left foot. So 
when tryouts start, uh, I hope you'll give me a consideration. Um, but I am here to speak on behalf of the proposal and uh, talk a little bit about the economics of the transaction, the, the uh, rationale for the transaction, uh, and talk a little bit about the benefits that soccer will bring to Nashville and the benefits that this proposal will bring to the fairgrounds uh, specifically. So taking a step back, the uh, purpose of uh, today's discussion is to talk about the specific questions that the chair raised, but we wanted to initially take a step back and, and talk about what this uh, opportunity really means for the city of Nashville and, and what it really means for our community broadly. I think the most important thing for us all to keep in mind is that soccer unites us in a unique way. It is a global sport. We just saw the World Cup happen uh, and how billions of people around the world uh, took in that sporting event and it united people across cultures. We believe that Major League Soccer coming to Nashville will do the same thing for this community. And if you were at the Planning Commission meeting, you saw the broad diversity of folks who came and spoke on behalf of this opportunity. It really is a part of Nashville's growingly diverse and global brand. And and it's not just in the participants in the sport, but it's actually in the proposal that's been put forward in terms of the DBE proposal for participation in the construction and development of this project. There is also a community benefits agreement that is under negotiation and that we're working uh, positively towards that, uh, that will include affordable housing uh, and other benefits for the community, uh, including investments the team will be making uh, broadly in the Nashville community. Those are the things tied directly to this proposal and the benefits to the community, but there is also just the basic economics of investing in our urban core. By locating a stadium here in the center uh, of Nashville and uh, along a transit corridor, we believe that there are tremendous opportunities exemplified by the proposed private development that will occur on this site, the 10 acres that we'll talk about in some more detail. We believe that this is a financially prudent deal for the taxpayers of Davidson County. Um, there's an, an upfront investment that we'll talk a little bit more about, um, but that investment produces returns in the form of property taxes and economic activity uh, in, to, the, uh, to the community. There is also, most importantly, and I know that there are a lot of folks here, myself included, who care very deeply about the fairgrounds and about the future of the fairgrounds. And it's very important to understand the economics for the fairgrounds. First, there will be $25 million invested up front in new facilities for the fairgrounds. The activities that happen out there, Christmas Village, the flea market, and all of the other activities have thrived despite the fact that there's been an underinvestment in that facility. This proposal will involve $25 million of investment in new facilities to better facilitate those uh, events and other potential future events to occur at the fairgrounds. But it's not just the $25 million that happens up front, but it's also ongoing funding. As you all know from the discussions we've had previously, half of the property taxes generated at the private development will go towards further improvements at the fairgrounds. This is a capital infusion that has not been discussed in this city for far too long and one that we're excited and believe is an important component of the proposal. All of these things will help preserve the existing uses at the fairgrounds and create the opportunity for additional investments in the fairgrounds. And that is a vital part of the ongoing commitment, not just because the charter requires it, uh, but because it's the right thing for this community to invest in the fairgrounds. And we're excited about modernizing this aging infrastructure, creating additional green space and further improving that facility. So, that's the overall proposal before us today and that we'll be talking about over the next several weeks. This is the agenda for today's meeting. We'll talk about the 2017 legislation, how we got here, uh, MLS's expansion, uh, and John Ingram from the team is here to talk a little bit about what a remarkable uh, development that was for the city overall. And we'll delve into more details. We have a representative of the Fair Board here to talk about the Fair Board, uh, Fairgrounds Improvement Plan. And then we'll talk about MLS, the stadium, the parking that you requested, uh, and the council legislation. And then most importantly, we'll leave this open for questions from you on that. So this body, 
voted in November of last year, 31 to six in favor of a proposal, a proposal that had many uh, contingencies on it and many things that needed to be worked out, but a framework proposal. That framework and pro proposal included $225 million of revenue bonds that would finance the stadium in conjunction with a $25 million cash investment from the team and $25 million investment in infrastructure from the city. In addition, there were to be $25 million of general obligation bonds to improve the fairgrounds for all existing facilities that I just spoke about, uh, and the $25 million from the team costs. The team ownership will pay every penny of cost overrun beyond that required for the construction of the stadium. There is zero obligation from the city part to pay for any cost overruns, and that's important. Now, as a part of this, and I know it'll be a big part of the discussion, it's important for us to talk about the 10-acre private development. Folks have even said to me, how did this happen? This sort of, why is this random thing attached to the soccer deal? I'm for soccer, but I've got questions about this part of it. It's important to understand this is an integral part of the financing of this overall proposal. As we'll talk about a little bit more, this is, we think one of the best economic deals done for the city ever. And part of the reason is the private development that will occur on the 10 acres is what's going to help finance and pay off the investment. It's how the city can get a major league soccer team, a brand new stadium with substantial benefits for the community and only put up $25 million of investment on the front end. It's because this private development on what is today primarily paved asphalt on a hill, but can be turned into an exciting development with a reconfiguration of the fairgrounds plan that we can have this uh, type of deal. And as I mentioned earlier, 50% of the property taxes generated at the development will be reinvested in the fairgrounds. After that vote, between then and November and today, there have been a series of public meetings and hearings that have occurred. There were two public hearings in 2017 with almost a thousand people in attendance. There was a four day charrette that some of you may have attended back in May that talked about the fairgrounds improvement plan that had input from hundreds of neighbors uh, and other community stakeholders. There have been now two dozen appearances by members of the team uh, before uh, the count Metro Council, the fair, go uh, the fair board, and uh, the sports authority, and numerous other meetings uh, with community members. Those meetings have resulted in uh, a series of approvals that have led us to the discussion and the proposals that are before you as the council. On July 11th, the fair board of commissioners unanimously approved the stadium ground lease. On July 19th, the Sports Authority unanimously approved the ground lease, the Na Nashville Soccer Holdings Stadium Lease and Construction uh, Administration Agreements, and then as uh, Councilman Bedney just referred to, uh, uh, on uh, August 1st, Metro Planning Commission unanimously approved the rezoning. And so those are the approvals that have happened to date. And now we come back to the council as we said we would do back in November to ask for your formal approval uh, of the proposals to both finance and invest in the fairgrounds and finally bring uh, Major League Soccer uh, to Nashville. But to talk about the investments that the team is making, uh, I'll turn it over now to John Ingram to talk about how we got here today. Thank you, Matt. Chairs, thank you. And, and thank you to the other uh, committee members that are here. Um, it really is, I appreciate deeply the opportunity to be here. And if we, let's see, I guess it's up to me to go forward. There we go. Um, I vividly remember last December 20th when MLS came to town to award Nashville our club. And I use that word very intentionally, um, our because it's not just about me, it's not just about our private efforts, it's really about Nashville coming together, the public and the private. And it really took both coming together to make this, make this happen, and we did it. 
and it's, it's a really remarkable achievement. I don't think anything like this has happened in the history of professional um, sports in our, in our country. Uh, when we started this process, um, we, there, there were 12 cities that were applying, that were vying for, for a spot. And I can tell you very clearly that um, if, they, if MLS were honest and force ranked uh, the bids when we started, Nashville would have been at the bottom, 10 to 12, somewhere in there, there's no question. Um, but because the private and public came together and we did it in an amazing amount of time, um, we were able to rise all the way to the top. And it's an amazing feat. Somebody will chronicle it, write about it in the future. Um, but um, it's just something that wouldn't, that just would not have happened. And, and, I, and I say that because part of what happened was this group, the Metro Council, was willing to, to take up um, the financing proposal, the stadium financing proposal, on a, on a quicker than normal basis. And without that, our whole, this whole effort would have been for naught. We would, we would absolutely not be where we stand today where MLS is excited like crazy to have Nashville as one of the teams. And I, and I, I really wanted to make this point that I think it, it represents a large part of what is right and special about Nashville. And it's not that we don't have our challenges. I recognize that Nashville has challenges and not everything is perfect. But there's a lot that's really good and special about Nashville. And, and I think our secret sauce is unlike so many other cities and so many other cities that we passed on our way from 12 to one um, in, in, in the rankings, we're able to come together as partners and make big transformative things happen. And make no mistake about it. I mean, soccer is happening in this country. It's happening in the city and, and it's happening across our nation. And I predict sooner rather than later that uh, professional soccer will zoom by many of the other traditional um, American sports in terms of popularity. And Matt mentioned part of the reasons. Why is it? It's because it's a global sport and it appeals to, to parts of our community that quite frankly have been underserved in the past. I mean, the immigrant community, the foreign born national community, uh, communities. They all, they all relate to this um, in, 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 very, in very real ways. And in addition to that, younger people, millennials and, and below, this is their sport of choice uh, over so many of the other traditional um, American sports. So um, this, is, this is my part of the presentation, but I really wanted to just take a step back to, to make sure that this group knows what a, spe what a special thing that we have done, and we've done it together. Um, and, and I think getting this over the finish line is really a chance to show the rest of this country and, and a chance to reaffirm to all of us here in Nashville that we can come together. We still got it. We can come together and do, and do the things that have make our city a great, great place. So thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you, John. Caleb Hemmer from the Fair Board to talk about that process. Great, Chairman, uh, members of the council, thank you for uh, allowing me to address you from a Fair Board perspective. Uh, this plan is uh, its a culmination of many, many years of uh, work we've been doing on the Fair Board. This is something that we haven't just come up with overnight and, uh, and seeking the stakeholder and community input. Uh, you know, the board strongly supports this plan uh, that's in front of you today. Uh, the, the kind of the sum of the whole parts enables a goal that we've all been striving for, which is to secure the future and the revitalization of the fairgrounds. Oh. All right. Yeah, talking to the mic a little closer. All right. Can you hear me? Uh, the fairgrounds improvement plan that you're, you're seeing on the screen here is a comprehensive approach to the modernization uh, and activation of the property that we see. Uh, the goal has always been to maintain the existing uses, the speedway, the, uh, <clears throat> the various expo events that we do, uh, flea market most importantly that uh, is, is the, the most revenue we get from a fair board perspective. Um, and so while integrating these new uses from uh, the soccer to the various events that we plan to hold. Um, after numerous studies uh, and recommendations that we have done over the years, the council has uh, either uh, started or the fair board, uh, those, those plans went nowhere. Um, and so now it's time to act on this forward thinking, uh, well thought out plan uh, that it adds also, uh, as Mr. Wilshire 
said add significant stabilizing revenue and funding to our to our fairgrounds annual budget. Next slide, please. Uh, the fair board initiated uh, the, the study of the relocation of the expo facilities and mixed use in, uh, on the site. Uh, in fact, uh, the fairgrounds is moving forward with a uh, a different plan earlier on uh, with with. Uh, funding from the council it was a part of the initial $12 million where we were uh, looking at new facilities uh, when the MLS thing happened. So we were able to actually supercharge the plan and make it much, much better. And that's the plan that's before you today. Um, uh, um, one of the other things that uh, mentioned too is, uh, I forgot to mention last time, was the, the, the shared use of the, some of the civic uh, pl plazas and, and promenades for the events. Uh, uh, such as the flea market and the state fair, uh, will be able to incorporate it into the stadium and the, and the entire site, which is something that uh, we don't really have a lot happening today. It's usually just bits and pieces. Um, so having this comprehensive plan really helps us, uh, you know, enable the whole whole site, particularly the uh, the new fair park that uh, we're very excited about. Uh, in May, uh, the fairgrounds hosted a community engagement discussion uh, facilitated by the National <coughs> Civic Design Center that was really great. Uh, we we uh, you know. We had hundreds of uh, people come in, uh, be a part of that. What you see here on the, the, the word uh, association, you see here on the, on the slide right here is some of the things that, that people did not like uh, about the, the property, but the larger items are the things that are mentioned more, more frequently. Um, but uh, but the, the talks that we have, you know, they just didn't just start at the, the uh, community discussion there, but uh, We've been talking about this for years on the monthly fair board meetings. We have individual meetings with staff and stakeholders, a neighborhood and community uh, input as well. Um, uh, if we go to the next slide too. Um, so the, um, sorry, one more back. The, uh, this, this is the word association is talking about the different uh, good things that people like about the property if you haven't had a chance to see it. So flea market, Christmas village, uh, location. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the, the fairgrounds, uh, fair board, excuse me, approved uh, unanimously the site plan uh, shown here and, and will be before you shortly. Uh, you know, the council is also aware we've been partnering with Metro Parks uh, on Fair Park. It's a 22 acre phase one uh, at, the, at the flood plain at the bottom that'll have uh, soccer fields, greenways, uh, and other green spaces that's uh, under, under uh, construction right now, and, uh, according to Councilman Sledge, looking real good. So. Um, the Speedway uh, and Concourse has also been part of the fair, Fairgrounds improve, Improvement Project that we've been doing. Um, recently, we put in new LED lighting, completed renovated restrooms, um, adding, added new fencing. So, uh, so the goal is, you know, improve the entire property, not just bits and pieces of it. Thank you. And now we'll have Chris Rhodes from Kimberly Horn come up to talk a little bit more about sort of the overall uh, plan for the Fairgrounds. One of the topics that was mentioned of interest was parking. So let's, let's talk a little bit about parking. The, the image you have in front of you today is three weeks ago, what we had an event at fairgrounds, that's the Vans Warped Tour. I don't wear Vans and I'm not a warped tour, but <laughs> our office is adjacent to this facility. So being the traffic engineer on the team, being the traffic engineer on the team, we got an opportunity to sort of see how this came about. Uh, today, Fairgrounds has the ability at maximum capacity to park 4,500 4, cars at a facility. One thing I'll also mention is of the various events, the flea market being one of those examples, in many cases we will park that individual parking space two or three times throughout the course of the day. As you may come to a flea market event and you'll only be there for a couple of hours and two or three people may use that same spot throughout the day. So today for existing flea market events, a maximum of 4,500 cars that we can park. Now let's fast forward and look at what this facility will look at at build out. The image you have before you shows the soccer field at the bottom. You'll see the various phases of, phase of fair park that sort of wrap around the speedway and are adjacent to Craighead Street, two phases of, of fair park being built out. And then the upper left hand corner, you'll see that in orange, that is the new fairgrounds expo and flea market facilities. Everything else that you see there in blue represents parking that's available for all the various fairgrounds event as well as a potential MLS stadium. So as we look at what we have it build out three years from now, once everything is built, we will have 4,500 parking spots available for both fairgrounds use as well as an MLS event. 
Now, you may say, how does that compare to some of the other venues we have? Our stadium will, will house 30,500 30, fans with 4,500 parking stalls. So we're able to house about 14% of our fans with on-site parking. How does that compare to some of the other venues that we've built here in the metro area the last several years? Nissan Stadium for an NFL event. We can house about 11% of that parking on site at a Nissan Stadium event. Let's say we're going to have something at Bridgestone Arena, whether that be a concert or a, or a Predators hockey game. Roughly on site, we can house about 1% in terms of parking. And then finally, our newest facility, First Tennessee Park. We do not have any on-site parking, but we do have an adjacent parking garage and we can house about 9% of that in comparison to uh, the, the stadium capacity. So finally, I think the message is here, we're in good shape in terms of parking that's available on-site. It will not solve all of our parking problems, but we will certainly have other mechanisms to provide parking off-site for some of those solutions, while at the same time, we'll be able to accommodate the capacity that we need for existing fairground events. Hi, my name's Mary Kavara. I'm with uh, Nashville Soccer Holdings and uh, Ingram Industries. And so before we get into an update on the stadium and the mixed use development, I just wanna highlight several items that are different from last November. First of all, we understand that a community <laughs> benefits agreement is important and we're diligently working on this with Stand Up Nashville and we're committed to continue to work through this. The next item here is the ground lease for the mixed use development now includes a minimum rental payment of $200,000. And we know there's been some questions about how does that work? Well, under the stadium lease, the team has the right to retain all of the parking <coughs> revenue. However, we have agreed to share 50% of the non-soccer parking revenue with the fairgrounds. And so, for example, if that parking share amount is less than $200,000, then we would pay an additional amount up to the 200,000 as rent under the ground lease. If on the other hand, the parking revenue share exceeds 200,000, then that entire amount is considered rent and the fairgrounds would retain all of it. The development, as many have commented, will also generate property taxes currently <coughs> estimated at $75 million over the term of the stadium lease. And this calculation is based on the current property tax rate and an estimated development cost of $200 million. And as you know, uh, we're still working through refining that, but for those that are interested in details, that's uh, where those numbers came from. Since last fall, we've also continued to refine our thoughts about the stadium, and we've increased the size by 3,000 seats to a total of 30,500. The additional seats will also provide some additional funding to the capital expenditure reserve over the stadium term, lease term. And the last item here that I wanna point out is that the team will also enter into an agreement directly with the fair board. And this agreement includes the same scheduling language as in the stadium lease, in addition, it will also address other topics such as operating protocols, sharing the parking revenue, maintaining open greenways during stadium events, and other items as we continue to work through that. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I'll try to speak loudly so everybody can hear me. My name is Ron Sally. I'm with CAA Icon, and we are the project managers for the stadium. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate <coughs> what Mr. Ingram had stated earlier. Uh, our firm is in the business of overseeing the construction of sports and entertainment facilities internationally. And we've had a significant amount of experience in public-private projects, uh, but we have not had one quite like this one. Um, and so to see what transpired over the last year, to see Nashville come from, as he referenced, being ranked as far as likelihood of having a franchise at the very bottom, to actually being an awarded an expansion franchise is really, really been incredible to see. So we are very um, thankful um, and feel great about being part of this, which, which is going to be a fantastic project. As you see on the screen, we have a project that has a seating capacity of 30,500 seats. 
Uh, we've got a budget of $253 million, and our target opening is 2021. Uh, we've engaged with a, an architect, which is Populous, which is referenced there. Uh, and our target first MLS game is in March of 2021. Uh, the governing documents that you see on the screen, uh, the development agreement and the construction administration agreement will really govern how the project is being run. Um, we have had, uh, for those that are interested on the public-private project perspective, from an MLS perspective, there have been several projects, including the Portland Timbers, uh, Real Salt Lake, Colorado Rapids, uh, Houston Dynamo, and also uh, the Philadelphia Union. Um, some of our non-MLS projects that have also been public-private projects include uh, what's currently being constructed, which is the new football stadium for the Las Vegas <coughs> Raiders. Um, I still struggle to say Las Vegas Raiders, but um, uh, and also the Chase Center uh, for the Golden State Golden State Warriors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide gives you some perspective on construction costs to some of the recent um, um, and also uh, not so recent MLS projects, uh, which lays out the construction costs. And a figure that we also use is the cost per seat, uh, which takes into consideration the different uh, seating capacities for those uh, stadiums that are referenced. So as you can see, Nashville is in a really, a really good place based upon the data that we've received um, related to these projects. So thank you very much. As we move to, to stadium scheduling, we also understand this is an area where there's been a lot of questions. We do thoroughly understand the importance of coordinated scheduling at the Fairgrounds Nashville site. Both the stadium lease and the operations agreement spell out how the scheduling process will work. We'll work with the Fairgrounds Executive Director so that the Fairgrounds can continue to provide events as set forth in the Metro Charter. And we also know that we'll sit down at the beginning of each year as we get the schedule from MLS and as the Fairgrounds has their schedule for the year and work through the times to, to make sure that we can accommodate uh, Fairgrounds events, including the flea market and Christmas Village. Then. MLS soccer, the regular season generally runs March through October. There's only 17 home matches during this time frame, so on average that means a couple matches most months. Then under the uh, lease agreement, Metro also has 20 days of rent-free use of the stadium. I know there's also been questions on other uses, but the way that we've kind of said it is the prior, we'll work with the flea grounds, uh, excuse me, the fairgrounds existing <coughs> events, we'll work with our MLS soccer events, and then we'll work through to schedule other items that we've talked about, that there would be some concerts. However, in the beginning, we're really gonna be focused on getting our soccer team launched and giving the best experience we can to the fans, and then we'll figure out those other items that we think can also be um, accretive to the site, such as could be some NCAA collegiate events, could be lacrosse, could be something else there, uh, maybe even uh, a football event, but uh, we'll be mindful of the, the natural turf. So turning to the mixed-use development, and as a reminder, our arrangement is very different than the other professional sports venues in town. We're responsible for repaying 100% of the revenue bonds issued by the sports authority. The November 2017 resolution provides for a 10-acre ground lease for development by the ownership team. And as you know, or as you might remember from last year, the Turner family is part of our MLS ownership group. They're the ones that have the experience and expertise in this area, and that's really why Market Street is being involved uh, in this portion of the transaction. We also strongly believe that the mixed-use development can provide the type of amenities needed to make the MLS match experience very successful, and we also believe it's going to be benefit the other users of the fairground and the neighborhood. The mixed-use development consists of residential units that will include affordable workforce housing, retail, and commercial space. And as someone had commented earlier, um, earlier in the week on Wednesday, the Planning Commission unanimously approved the South Nashville Community Plan Amendment and the Fairgrounds Mixed-Use District. As we think about the mixed-use benefit, there's also a benefit not just to the team or MLS and not just those that live in the Wedgwood-Houston neighborhood, but to our broader community. 
This project does not displace any residents and it will provide some needed affordable and workforce housing. It also means that there's gonna be more private sector investment, jobs, and quality of life options for the district and neighborhood residents. And lastly, it will provide recurring revenues for the fairground in terms of rent under the ground lease and 50% of the property taxes, which we're currently estimating about $1.3 million a year. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, John Cooper. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, before I talk about the legislation, I'll address the issue that Chairman Swope raised at the beginning um, regarding the charter and whether there are any legal concerns associated with this development and the charter. Um, I will read from the charter um, referendum that, that was approved back in 2011. And it says, all activities being conducted on the premises of the Tennessee State Fairgrounds as of December 31st, 2010, shall be continued on the same site. There is no prohibition against adding uses at the fairgrounds. So the Department of Law does not believe there is a charter problem with either the stadium or the mixed use development. On to the legislation that you have pending before you. There are four pieces of legislation. First is the ticket tax and demolition ordinance. Uh, the charter requires that um, if you're going to demolish facilities at the fairgrounds, the council has to approve that with an ordinance by tw receiving 27 affirmative votes. Um, in addition, the state law regarding ticket tax requires 27 votes. So this ordinance um, will require 27 votes on third reading. Uh, it approves the demolition of the structures at the fairgrounds necessary for the construction. And it also approves a new ticket tax in accordance with state law. The ticket tax would be $1.75 per ticket for years one through five of the stadium operation. Starting in year six, an additional amount is added to the ticket tax to be used toward uh, capital expenses later on at the stadium that, that will come up. So for year six and seven, the ticket tax is 225 per ticket with 50 cents being de dedicated to capital expenditures. And then starting in year eight, it goes to $2.50 with 75 cents dedicated to capital expenditures. I would point out that the state law requires all ticket tax money be used for ex exclusively to defray costs associated with constructing and improving the stadium. So that is not a revenue stream that can be used for other purposes. It's specific to the stadium. In addition, state law limits the amount of the ticket tax to uh, no more than 10% of the ticket price. So these amounts are within that 10% that range. Next is the zoning ordinance that you've already heard about. Uh, this would change a 10 acre portion of the fairgrounds from industrial warehouse and distribution zoning district to a specific plan zoning district that would permit the mixed use development. Next is the ground lease ordinance for the private development portion. This ordinance does two things. First, it declares the 10 acre development site to be surplus. Uh, the council enacted legislation a few months ago to require leases over a certain number of years um, for the property to be declared surplus. And so this ordinance does that. In addition, the fair board will be considering the uh, dec surplus decor declaration and the ground lease at their next meeting on August 14th. Uh, the second thing uh, it does is to actually approve the lease with National Soccer Holdings Development LLC. That is uh, an affiliate of the MLS team ownership um, that Mary has already talked about. This is a 99 year lease, which is consistent with the resolution the council adopted in November of last year. As Mary mentioned, there is a minimum annual rent payment of $200,000, which will be offset by the 50% portion of the non-soccer 
stadium event parking revenue that the team provides to the fairgrounds. So this is new revenue to the fairgrounds, which coupled with the 50% in property taxes generated at the fairgrounds will provide an additional uh, revenue enhancement for them uh, that they do not currently have. Uh, the, I would point out that a phase one environmental study has been done on the property and it, the results indicate no need for a phase two. Uh, the property under the terms of the lease will be delivered to the uh, private developer not later than June 30th, 2019, which is the same date as the stadium construction commencement date. Uh, Metro is responsible for providing utilities up to the project boundary, and the private developer will be required to build at least a $150 million mixed-use development on the site. If construction does not commence within two years, the developer will have the option uh, three one-year extensions at a cost of $200,000 per extension. If construction does not commence after five years, uh, Metro could terminate the lease and it, it would revert back to Metro. Uh, the private developer is required to maintain insurance against all loss or damage, as well as to indemnify Metro from any loss arising out of their use or operation of the property. Uh, the lease can be terminated in the event the developer uh, becomes insolvent. Uh, the lease also includes a list of prohibited uses that mirror the prohibited uses in the stadium lease that the Sports Authority approved. Uh, finally, we have the $50 million general obligation bond resolution. Uh, this will allow access to $50 million in commercial paper to be used for um, the infrastructure and for the new fairgrounds. Uh, buildings, 25 million for the new fairgrounds facilities and 25 million for infrastructure work associated with the stadium construction. That includes roads, sidewalks, water, sewer, electrical, um, similar types of infrastructure costs. And then the debt service on that general obligation bond would be paid uh, by Metro through the general fund. Um, going on to the timeline, uh, the legislation for the three ordinances uh, will be up on first reading uh, next week, August 7th. There will be a special council meeting on August 27th to have the public hearing on the private development zoning bill and second reading on that ordinance. And then third reading would be September 4th for all three ordinances. The Bond resolution has also been filed, but it will be deferred to track with the ordinances so that everything is considered on the, for the final reading on September 4th. So that's a lot of information. It's a lot of information because you guys have asked a lot of questions. And there are a lot of important things to consider with this. It's a big opportunity. There are not big transformative opportunities that come along very often. But about 18 months ago, one came along. And despite the fact that Nashville did not have a long history in soccer and that there were other cities that had had successful USL teams for quite some time, there was a leadership team that believed in Nashville and believed in the future of soccer here. And they made their investment and made a commitment to pay the expansion fee, if successful. And as John talked about, they came to this body and said, look, we want to cut a new kind of deal with you. We want to cut a deal that doesn't look like the deals that have been done in the past. We want to cut a deal that's going to pay for itself and then some for the city directly through the activities that are happening on the site. And we want to facilitate additional investment in the fairgrounds. And when they came forward with that proposal and this body asked questions, this body took that opportunity to make a transformative decision. And last November did and voted 31 to 6 
to, in order, to enable us to go forward and explore the possibility of bringing Major League Soccer to Nashville. And the next month, Major League Soccer chose Nashville as the 24th expansion team. This is a sport for all of Nashville. There are kids who play soccer around the globe with a t-shirt balled up and taped up. This is a sport that everyone can participate in and tens of thousands of kids around the community, around the state do participate in it. It's one that is gr growing globally and is an opportunity for Nashville to take advantage and embrace <coughs> the future of this sport in the United States. There were lots of things to consider. As you heard John uh, Cooper say, uh, we believe that the proposal put forward clearly complies with the compliance with the, with, is clearly compliant with the charter amendment that was put forward. And all of the legal considerations have been evaluated in great detail, but we wanna answer questions. We don't want there to be any doubt about any of it, but we are excited about this because we believe that it actually enables future investment in the fairgrounds that is long overdue. Upfront investment in building new facilities to host the incredible events that happen there and ongoing funding through the 10 acre private development and the ground lease that will help facilitate the sustaining, uh, the sustaining those activities into the future. This will provide activity in this district and have spillover benefits, we believe, to the entire surrounding community. But we don't just have to believe it. The team is working diligently with Stand Up Nashville, who's here, and to make sure that the, this project has true community benefits. And that's hard. It's hard because it hasn't been done in this city, as you all know, in past projects. But we're working to try and break ground on a new community benefits model that takes a little bit of sacrifice from everybody involved and creates real opportunity for real community benefits directly associated with the construction of this project. And overall, and I think most importantly, for some folks who care about the finances of this project, the finances of all projects, I know you all do, this is one that protects the taxpayers and actually adds additional revenue, both from the 10 acre development and from the overall uh, activities that are gonna come with this. There's a report on the economic impact that Major League Soccer has, but you know it, you see it. There were 70,000 people who attended the Major League Soccer All-Star Game in Atlanta last week. I mean, this sport is growing by leaps and bounds and we wanna be a part of it and we believe that this project and this proposal puts forward precisely the kind of deal that this community should embrace. And so with that, we know we've given lots of information and we wanna be here as long as you all need to answer every question that you all have. And if Mary and I will be here to help direct the questions to the best person to answer those. So, um, Chairs, thank you so much for uh, giving us this time and, and let us know how you'd like us to proceed. Mr. Wilshire, Mr. Turner and company, thank you all. Um, with my co-chair's permission, we're gonna take questions from any committee, not one at a time, is that fair? Yeah. So, fire away, guys. Mr. Glover. Here's a shocker for you. So let's walk through a couple of things, and, and, I, and, I, and, and Chair, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions right now, and then I would like to uh, hear some of the responses on this, uh, and then Mr. Wilshire, I'm just gonna go ahead and say this to you, okay? Yes, this body voted 31-6. 48 hours later, this body was informed we were closing Metro General Hospital. I believe if the vote would have happened one week later, it wouldn't have been 31-6. And so therefore, and the reason I bring that up is because once again, here we go, we gotta get this done, gotta pass it now, without understanding everything that's going on with the deal. There's a lot of this that still is out there. And when we talk about that the city has no liability, that's just wrong. We do have liability. We have $4 million a year liability in the first five years. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely correct. Right, so we do have liability. It's not a 100% deal here. Then we have a $3 million liability for the next five years. So my math is semi, but that's $35 million the taxpayers will be on the hook for. And I can assure you 
because Nashville's pretty much so figured us out. If we put it in there to spend it, we're going to spend it. In fact, we're going to spend beyond what we can afford. And so therefore, in just a second, yes. So therefore, let's don't say the city doesn't have any liability here and doesn't have any expense. We do. To Chairman Bednay, yes, I absolutely said the other night that the Planning Commission needed to hand it over to us because none of these commissions, none of these boards are responsible to the taxpayers. They're not the ones who are elected. We, this body, are responsible to the taxpayers on answering why we don't either pay the raises, why we translate things differently than what they thought they were voting on, and why we don't necessarily respect them. Because that's a lot of what I'm hearing right now. And then to Mr. Cooper, is he still in here? Mr. Cooper, from August 8, 2013, this is in the city paper, and if I may, I'll read verbatim what the, what the article says. When Metro Council Attorney John Cooper opined nearly two weeks ago that Tennessee State Fairgrounds could not be or could not be redeveloped without an amendment to the Metro Charter, the property's tireless supporters declared it a big victory. In the two years since a countywide referendum on the fairgrounds passed with 71% of the vote, many in the media, the public, and the government believed the bar for pursuing redevelopment was 27 votes of the 40-member council. Cooper's opinion means it's higher than that and would ultimately require another vote from the public to undo what they did in 2011. Now, I was in that meeting. I was here. I may be one of the only council members that's on the floor right now that was in that meeting. I remember this conversation, and I remember the conversation rather vividly simply because the voters did go vote. So, Chair, I'm, I'm, I've got several other questions, but I'm, I'm going I'm, to, I will yield now and then uh, come back and, 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 and I, 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 you know, look forward to hearing the responses to, to my initial questions. I'm sure we'll be back to you, Councilman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilson, do you want to address or Mr. Cooper at this moment or it's up to you? Uh, you should be hot. Sure. Uh, the redevelopment plans that were being considered in 2013 would have involved a cessation of some of the uses. And so the opinion was based upon some of those uses stopping. There is nothing in the charter that says you cannot add uses. And I did not opine in 2013 that you could not redevelop the property to add uses. You could not redevelop the property if you were going to stop any of the existing uses. Okay, so let me ask you this, Mr. Cooper, since you brought this up, because, again, this is where we all kind of got confused when they did away with the gun shows out there. We interpreted that if it was going on uh, December 31st, 2010, that it had to continue. And then the opinion was, no, it doesn't have to continue. Uh, it just, we, we have to continue certain things. So we kind of we kind of cherry pick is what it looks like. And again, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm, I'm just listening to what's been said. And the fact of the matter is, we don't have a gun show out there now that was out there that generated $350,000 a year. The gun show was an event that was held at the Expo Center. The Expo Center is the activity that had to be continued, and this, this matter was litigated. Oh, right. No, I, I'm fully aware and, and understand how that came out. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Wilson. So, uh, Councilman Glover, the numbers, you um, look at each of these deals in great detail, and, and I know you know this, so I'll just say it to the, the broader audience to make sure the $4 million guarantee that you referenced and the $3 million guarantee that you referenced are understood broadly. The structure is, to satisfy the debt service on the bonds, it is anticipated that the annual debt service payment will be approximately $13 million. That will be funded two ways, uh, by rent payments uh, from the team um, and by uh, two sources, the ticket tax that we've talked a little bit about uh, and the sales taxes generated at the stadium on all the things that fans come to buy at the stadium. The guarantee that you referenced 
is a guarantee by Metro that in the first five years, those two components specifically, the ticket tax and the sales taxes generated at the stadium, will be at least $4 million in the first five years, and then that declines to $3 million in the next five years. So if I said that there's no exposure or expense to the city, I misspoke, and I apologize to you and to the audience for that. There is. In fact, there's investment up front by this body. This body is making a $25 million upfront investment in the infrastructure going on out there and in the facilities at the expo uh, and, and the 50 fair million, market. isn't it? Not Co just 25. 25 in each. 25 yeah, in 50 each. million, yes. right. Yes. Which yes. that's a different debt payment, it is. correct? It is. It yes. is. Mm -hmm. And so, so the, the uh, $4 million uh, and $3 million, if no one bought anything and there were zero tickets sold to all of the uh, games that happened out there, yes, Metro would have exposure. I think it is a reasonable expectation to assume that there will be at least one, well, I can tell you, I will be in the audience for each of those. So uh, there will be at least some ticket tax and I'll buy a couple of hot dogs and, uh, and, and probably a jersey or two. So you're right, there is some exposure and it may happen. I mean, look, I, I'm not gonna sit here and say I have a crystal ball in the future. I know exactly what the capacity of the stadium will be, but uh, Mary, I don't know if you wanna talk at all about what the expectations are, but I think, you know, look, there may be some exposure. I'm not, I don't wanna sit here and three years down the road, come back and say, look, those two things only totaled up to 3.8 million. Like there's 200 grand that we're on the hook for. There may be, and, and we should assume that there is some investment. We believe that this is worth it, even with additional investment by this body because of the activities that we talked about. But the benefits to the city that we were talking about are the property taxes generated by the 10 acre development and the overall economic activity, whether it's just the sales taxes construct, uh, collected on construction materials to build the thing, uh, or all of the other activities that will happen out there. So we've gone through and updated our base and optimistic cases that we shared last year. And under both of those models, in the first five years and even beyond, we don't indicate that there would be any type of shortfall. And we'd be happy to uh, share those schedules with the council again. And we'll make sure we get those out to you. All right. And then Ms. Lomax left. I mean, I, I don't see her back here, right? Okay, when she does come back, Chair, I have a specific question on uh, some financing, some of the other things I'd like to, to address with her. Thank right. you, Chair. I think we'll be back to, to talk to you later, yep. Councilman. Councilman Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just as a matter of process, is this our last bite at this apple? Will it come before committees as it makes its way through council? It will come through regular committees as it makes its way through council. However, as you well, you're well aware of, we have usually 15 to 30 minutes to address a whole host of issues at each mm -hmm. committee right. meeting. So okay. the big bite at the apple should be today. Okay, all right. Uh, let me go a couple of different directions here. Let's go back to the $4 million. Um, this is $4 million in liability, but as you correctly stated, uh, I was going to ask this question, but I believe, uh, and maybe the MLS people will be the perfect, be the people that uh, really respond to this, but what is the low bar on ticket sales to get us to the maximum $4 million amount? Is that zero? So if we sell no tickets, we're exposed for $4 million. Sell no tickets and no hot dogs and no jerseys no and no not if like there would have to be like nothing happening out right. there for that to happen. But okay. yes, all right. That uh, so I, I think we all can figure out how realistic that is. Uh, secondly, what is the bar for ticket sales that would get us to a flat line zero on that exactly four million dollars profit to where we're they're not making any more money in excess of that and we aren't paying any money. Do you have any idea how many tickets you would have to sell to reach that number? I have that information on the schedule that we can provide to you and we've got all the assumptions in there. I think we actually assume that the average attendance was only about 87% of the full uh, stadium size and in our base case and then we have an optimistic case assuming that there's higher attendance and then also the case depends on the number of concessions and goods sold to generate sales tax and uh, be happy to get those details to everybody. Okay, so that's not a packed stadium to reach that number, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, 
All right, and the uh, way I understand the deal is structured is we've got five years at $4 million exposure. Uh, under the worst case scenario where nobody shows up to a game. Um, and then we've got the best case scenario where you outsell the $4 million and you make more money beyond that. Is that, uh, that is a possibility, right? Yes, that's correct. And even in the optimistic case, we still don't, we didn't even go to 100% attendance. I think we went to high 90s. Okay. So let me ask you this. If we are, for example, exposed, uh, I think you can realistically assume that, well, it, it would be reasonable to think that maybe one year we might be exposed for uh, uh, an amount of money, and maybe in subsequent years you would outsell the $4 million. Um, is, it, is the deal structured in such a way where if we were to have to subs subsidize this by a million in year one for simplicity's sake, and you made in excess of $4 million, that we could get that money back that we've already paid into this based on your profits in excess of the $4 million? I'm going to look to Mr. Cooper because I believe it's more on an annual basis, but we can look at that comp component. It, it is an annual uh, basis, so you would not, if, if there was a subsequent year, you would not get money back. However, if they play games, um, like the lease with the sports authority allows them to play up to three games at another facility uh, if needed, but if they do that, then they would have to reimburse Metro for the lost sales and ticket tax revenue to make up that, that difference, so um, to, to reimburse Metro. So it's in, uh, based on what I heard you say, it's year to year, and once one year zeroed out, you can't factor that into subsequent years. Correct. Is that uh, uh, because of legal issues or because of the way the deal is currently structured? That's just the way the financing was structured. Okay. Is there a possibility you could restructure it? to accommodate for that. I think we're all looking at each other. Councilman, I think we're all looking at each other. Uh, I mean, I think the proposal before you is the proposal before you. We'd have to okay. investigate whether right. it can be altered or not. Just okay, let's move to the $200,000 then. I didn't quite understand uh, the $200,000 deal uh, with respect to the rent payment. Uh, I'm gathering this is a rent payment on the uh, piece of property. That's correct. So this is on the 10 acres for the mixed right. use development that last year in the resolution, we did not have any rent amount. Correct. And so we've, we've got 2000 in there. And what we've said is that the minimum rent payment would be $200,000. Now to the extent, and a new thing that we've added is at the fair board's request, they asked us to consider sharing some of the parking revenue, even though we have the rights to all of that. So we're kind of taking that out of our share of earnings and we're agreeing to share 50 percent of the non-soccer event parking revenue with the fairgrounds and you know if for example let's say that was a hundred thousand dollars since the rent payment or minimum rent payment is 200 we'd have to uh, pay an additional hundred thousand to the fairgrounds as part of the the payment so they would at least get a minimum minimum of 200 if, on the other hand, the share of the parking revenue exceeded two hundred thousand dollars, the fairground gets to keep fairgrounds get, would get to keep that actual amount, whatever it is. So there's a possibility for upside. So this is a minimum two hundred thousand dollar annual payment that could be higher, but never dips below two hundred thousand. That is correct. Okay. All right. I think I got that. Um, and the way I understand parking currently is you have forty five hundred spaces. You'll probably temporarily lose some of those uh, spaces in the construction process, but your desire is to have those 4,500 spaces operational by the time this stadium is built and we are holding soccer games there. Is that right? I think we'd probably ask Chris to come up and address that. Where is that? The short answer is yes, sir. That would be the goal. All right, thank you. Um, I have, uh, let's see here. Are, are any of the, uh, under the redevelopment plan, uh, clearly we are moving uh, the location of certain existing buildings on the fairgrounds uh, to be relocated in uh, the lower half or the lower portion of the property there. Are any of these buildings being constructed in floodplains or floodways? We'll have Ron Gobble address that. He's project manager for. Uh, no, we're using it up here. Yeah. 
minutes. We're one mic shy of a full deck. <laughs> Sorry, we're staying out of the flood buffer uh, totally. The microphone. Nothing is, nothing is being done in the flood plain that's not offset with other, other cuts and fills. So you have to balance it, but that's being taken into consideration. I'm not sure I understood that answer. Could you clarify that for me? Well, the, uh, this one, this one looks a little more oh, okay. Uh, essentially, you, in order to build where we're building, we have to offset and uh, balance the amount of cut and fill. So we're doing that, and we're not in the we're not in the floodplain. So if you happen to dip into a floodplain area, you've, you're building it above that level where it would be considered floodplain? Yes, sir. Okay, all right, I think I've got that. All right, from a scheduling perspective, can somebody talk to me about scheduling conflicts? I heard you mention it originally, uh, but what happens, and you said that you're gonna get together at the beginning of each year and work these out. Um, can you give me an idea of what that looks like and who has any level of authority over whom with respect to potentially soccer games occurring on a fairground or, or a flea market weekend? So we know, we will know what the flea market weekends are as we start to work with the MLS on the upcoming soccer schedule. And so there's some dates that are already set in advance. And then we've identified that to the extent that for some reason we might end up with a potential conflict, that we've agreed that between the fairgrounds, the MLS team, that we will go and work with MLS to see what we can do to get that rescheduled so that we could preserve the date of, you know, whatever's out there. And I think it's one of those that we've all committed to work in good faith. This is part of, um, in the stadium lease agreement, I don't have it right in front of me, but share the language that's in there. And we're also gonna use that same language will also be in our uh, operations agreement with the fair board as well. Okay, uh, we have similar conflicts at other venues. I believe the Predators just had uh, conflicts with other uh, events at Bridgestone Arena, which appeared to be worked out during the playoff season, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm assuming you work out these things in a very similar fashion? Absolutely. Okay. All right, well, I'm gonna to yield to my uh, uh, colleagues and not take up all the time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you very much for being here and answering these uh, tough questions. Uh, one of the things that uh, I have was just today with uh, some of the colleagues and other individuals inside of our districts uh, we're looking at the individual guarantor, and it's probably with uh, Mr. Cooper, the individual guarantor or surety uh, for if there's something that does happen with the soccer team, and let's say they're, they're not able to do and make it happen here in the city. Uh, I understand overall the bill will be stuck here with us, the taxpayers. Uh, are we in a place to where we have a, a guarantor or an insurer uh, to actually handle that? Because right now, what we are, if we're not able to give our employees raises, raises and all of that stuff, that's not an um, individual uh, thing that I, I would like to see the city pick up uh, overall. Uh, I think that does need to be a, a guarantor. Uh, to bring some surety to this to this issue, uh, because if we don't know what will happen, I, I would love to see the anything that the city has overall as far as professional sports to make it. I'm a supporter and cheerleader of whatever that we do, but uh, I don't want us to set, up, set ourselves up for the slam dunk, and we're back here looking and trying to find a way to make ends meet, and we come up short again and uh, tell the people that we represent that this body for sure and said that we were gonna take care of things for you and raise this work, I'm gonna go forward. These are the people that vote for us and uh, asked us to be here to speak for them. And I wanted to give you the opportunity for that and uh, we'll, we'll come back. Go ahead. So the, the guarantee issue is something that was um, heavily negotiated at the time the council considered the resolution in November, and the council added additional language to the resolution regarding the guarantee. 
So we have an unconditional team guarantee to cover the cost of the stadium construction, all of the rent payments, and all of the cost overruns on the stadium. The team is Mr. Ingram and the Turners, and Mr. Ingram has given his word that he's not going to leave the city high and dry. The agreement includes provisions that if Mr. Ingram is no longer the controlling owner, then we could implement uh, individual guarantees for subsequent owners. So, uh, Mr. Cooper, I, for some reason, I'm just, uh, that is one of the things that I'm having problems with because in business-wise, and I, I have a business of my own, uh, we kind of make sure that we get a lot of these things done up front uh, to make sure that we're on, okay on behalf of the city. Uh, this is something that I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, having a big problem with because that puts us in jeopardy, especially as the, the legal source of the city and all of those things because anything could happen and we should always have something that we'll, we're able to fall back on because uh, the way that it's set up right now, uh, we will be stuck with that debt if things don't go the way that we want it to go. I know Mr. Ingram is here. He is a great guy, Nashville native, you know, doing all of those things, and that's great. We have a home-based individual that's doing some great things in the city, and I know there's some other things that are coming up that we want to make sure that we guarantee that this debt is not going to fall on our backs. You know, in a few years, some of us are not going to be here. You know, some, some are falling off the, the, uh, the, in a year. Some of, some of us as individuals won't be here. But this is something that we're going to have to deal with because hopefully the MLS is going to be here for a long time. And I'm just saying we need to find a fail-safe issue or a or fail-safe way that we can fix this uh, while we're going along. And I don't want it to go over to where we're not paying attention to, to every dip and to every dollar that we're spending because it will fall back on us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Cooper. Uh, thank you, Chairman and Mr. All my Chairman. Um, a couple of uh, quick questions. Uh, again, I appreciate everybody being here and this opportunity to be on the record for a um, series of questions. Um, the first question, just to make sure to establish, I know it's been repeatedly asked for uh, in the past, is there any site selection materials, indication of a process, studies, ever done for the location of this stadium on the fairgrounds, as opposed to any other location in Davidson County? I, I'm not aware of, any, somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not aware of any other site selection. I mean, this was the selection that the team made, their choice, and the city no, made. No, Mary, yes, you want to answer that? So I'll just speak that at the point in time when we were involved, the fairgrounds was the site that uh, we've been working with the whole time. It was part of the application, and we've never been involved in discussing another site. If there's something right. that happened prior to that time, we're not aware of it. And, and I very much appreciate your candor in this. So the deeper question here is, is there any, you're asking for a quarter of a billion dollar investment from Metro. Is this the right place? And I'm not hearing that there's any study criteria, evidencing, proofing that was ever used to justify this investment in this site. So uh, any, anybody aware of any of that, please, Please stand up and share that with with the council. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're saying is we've come forward with a proposal. Th this is the proposal, I, I get it. and we think this is a great proposal. And if okay, there's a lot to do. My question was, is there any proofing study criteria, anything to indicate that this is really absolutely the best spot for a quarter of a billion dollar investment by, by Nashville? Okay, uh, I'm not hearing that there is. Um, let me, and, and Mary, I so appreciate you being here. If you would spend some time on how is it that you, there are a couple of statements in the council write-ups, et cetera, that the team is responsible for paying the debt service on the revenue bonds. If you would 
And there are two statements. One is the team is responsible for making the debt service and the revenue bonds. Secondly, the team is responsible for the remainder of the debt service via a rent payment. If you would just tell, tell us what that is. Sure, that under the stadium lease agreement, that it basically states that the team is responsible for the, the rent under the stadium is equal to the amount of debt service on the bonds. Then as part of that- Okay, I'm sorry, could we unpack that sentence again that you just said, that, that last sentence? Would you go over that sentence again? So I'd be happy to get the exact language from the stadium lease agreement. I don't have it all memorized. But basically, as part of the stadium lease agreement, the team is required to pay rent on an annual basis. The team, and, and that rent is $9 million a year? No, the rent is equal to the debt service on the revenue bonds that would be issued by the sports authority. Okay. So just the revenue bonds. Correct. The $225 million of revenue bonds. Correct. Which would be 13 or $14 million a year or over the life of the bonds, about $425 million. By the t I, that sounds probably right. By the time you add interest in there, it's yes. Okay. So you're, you're agreeing to the responsibility for that $425 million payment over the next 30 years, minus conceivably a couple of years of $4 million and a couple of years of $3 million. No, no. Five years at four, not, a, not five, two five years. Five at four. Five, five years at four and five years at three. So of the $425 million worth of principal and interest repayments over the next 30 years, there would be $35 million of that that conceivably the city would be responsible for. Okay. Sure. So all this comes down to responsible for, res responsible for. If you're responsible for it, why not you just issue the bonds and build the stadium? Because it's more advantageous financially to have the structure, have it structured this well, way. Well, you, you've got a billionaire guarantor. And, oh, by the way, what happened to Mr. Wolf? Was he, he was left out of the He's still, ownership. He remains part of the ownership group. All right, group. so you have three billionaires, okay, um, to issue. I doubt if there's really, this is taxable paper, is there really that much of an interest difference? I mean, is this about the financing costs between billionaire issuers and the city issuers. Actually, your balance sheet is probably better than ours these days. So the, my only comment from the team perspective is when we entered discussions with the city last year and it was, as we set forth on this path, it was always discussed that it would be part of a private-public partnership and this was one component of that transaction, and so this is the deal that we have here, and I, I can't really comment on that more. Well, I you say private. Okay, but you're, you're unwilling to issue the bonds themselves. Now, Cincinnati just funded a stadium, just put together a stadium deal. It's very interesting for people looking at this. That, that is being funded by the team, $212.5 million funded by the team. The city is putting up $34 million with infrastructure costs, but is getting back $6.2 million in improvements from the team, and their school system is getting $25 million back. So the city is getting back almost as much as they are putting into it, and then their owner is financing the stadium. Why should we accept a different deal than what Cincinnati is accepting? I can't comment on all the specifics of the Cincinnati deal, but one item that they are doing is they're actually displacing the school stadium, and part of their payment back to the school is to build a brand new stadium site. In this well, case, we're not displacing anything. Well, you are displacing a fairground. <laughs> you, you, you are displacing, so. That's right, and, yeah. that's, and okay. that's right, and that's why there's an investment to construct new and improved facilities for the expo facility in the other. Okay, all right, well, well, moving down, I know it's popular to say, gee, this stadium deal is so much better, though, compared to Cincinnati, that's clearly not true. And then let's go to the NIST. I don't think that's clearly the case, but I... Well, they are funding it. I mean, the team there is funding it, and, okay? And, and this overall package is generating $75 okay. million dollars of new revenue to be split between the general fund and the fair board. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so the Nissan stadium deal, you know, you're happy to say other stadium deals are not very good, but interesting, looking up the Nissan stadium deal, half, that was a $290 million stadium cost. Half of that money came from seat licenses, actually came from fans 
who are willing to invest in the experience. Have we tried selling seat licenses here? To date, seat licenses have not been sold at any MLS stadiums. It's something that uh, we're looking at, but based on our work with other advisors, um, it doesn't appear, soccer's just not quite there yet. Well, is that a warning light? That that financing system, then again, I'm, I'm uh, the mayor under which the Nissan Stadium deal was a very shrewd businessman, and it's very interesting to have the fans themselves pay for so much of that. And also, there was a library that the rest of the city, then not only were there circuses, so to speak, that the city was financing, but there was also a cultural improvement. There is no anticipated investment in a cultural improvement by the by the team in any of this or in any of these financing packages, right? I'm right. not quite sure exactly what you're asking, council person. Well, you're not, you're not offering to do something the way that in Cincinnati, you're not offering to, to make an investment back in the com community in some degree. For, for example, and I I'm, seek your guidance, all spring long, the people, the parents at Hume Fogg sent me emails going, there is no soccer field for the students at Hume Fogg, right? What to do about it? The parks can't come up with one. The school system can't come up with one. Would you all be willing to help create a s soccer experience? I mean, it's good, it's good for your business. I mean, you know, how is it that we're building you a soccer field, but we can't build Hume Fogg a soccer field? Well, that's the first time I've heard of it, but it's something be happy to talk to the folks that um, have details about it and we can come back okay. and figure out how it might fit, All right. fit in. And I appreciate everybody. I, I should note both uh, uh, Mr. Cooper and I are actually alumni of the right. Fog soccer team. And uh, I, there was no field then. There was no field, there was there, no field we then. We did pretty well. Still, Girl, the girls' soccer it? team, I think, actually uh, has been pretty successful so as well. There's been a long standing need for a field. All right. Let, if you can, let's spend a little bit of time on the 10 acres. He was way better than I was. I, should, um, I, 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 I shouldn't. I just, than all of us. Um, um, on, on the 10 acres, why $200,000? I mean, why $200,000? Sure. You're talking about the, the financing, right. the, the, and that, the and lease that, payment, the ground that, lease payment. The ground lease payment, and that's $200,000 for 30 years, right? So the lease is 99 years. The $200,000 payment is for 30 years. What happens to the next 69 years? Sure. So this is the initial payment. The initial payment is at least, and I, I want to be clear, it's at least $200,000. So it's, that's the okay. minimum payment. The, the uh, parking revenues may exceed that by, you know, and if they do, that's the benefit of the fairgrounds. All right. But that payment is only for 30 years, but the lease is for 99 years, right? So it's rent free for the next 69 years? It's tied to the stadium lease, which is 30 years. And so at the end of the stadium lease, um, there is an option to extend, but it's conditioned upon agreement of the parties at the time. But the 10 acre lease is You're the $200,000 is only for 30 years and the payment is only for 30 years but the granting of it is for 99 That's years. Correct. So there's so 69 years that are not covered here. The, the Metro at the end of the stadium lease would have that as a negotiating point for future extensions of the stadium okay. lease. But the 30 year payment, correct, is, is now, tied just to the stadium talking lease. Talking to people in the appraisal industry in Nashville, looking at the zoning that was approved by the planning commission on Wednesday night, 900 units of housing, 200 room hotel, 100,000 feet of retail, 200,000 feet of office. That's, we all agree that that is the package, right? That's approved by the SP zoning, right? Have I met, have I left anything material out? No, okay. Well, many people in the appraisal community, since zoning creates value, actually view that package as worth something on the order of $50 million, okay? So how are you leasing for only 30 years something that is worth $50 million for $200,000? That a normal ground lease would be 3 to 5% of the value. Now the appraisal is out of date. It is not taken apart. The zoning, which is creating the value here in the SP. So why $200,000? 
that is a minimum payment. The, the, again, the value may be in excess of that based upon how the parking works out. Well, but, all right, all right, let's talk about the parking. This is non-soccer parking, okay? I'm not quite sure what that means. I mean, that's just general parking on the site, okay? <laughs> that would be for other events at the stadium that are not soccer, so okay. concerts. Well, if you don't mind pulling up a map game. and show me where the parking is coming. This is parking not on the 10 acres? No, it's defined as events that are not related to soccer at the stadium, and so as Mr. But, Cooper said- But where are people parking the actual cars? I'm parking the car, I'm getting out, I'm paying somebody. We'll ask Chris to talk about that. Okay. Uh, okay, as you look at this graphic here, see the stadium to the left is structured parking as part of mixed use. Okay, I'm sorry, which letter number is that? Uh, let's look just east, see where the school is? See the, the blue rectangle? That's one of the mixed use pods. Just north of that is Benton Curves. That's a second mixed use pod. And then across the street from Benton is the third mixed use pod. Okay, is that part of the 10 acres? Yes, sir. That is part of the 10 acres, and you are building the, for the parking, or is that parking coming out of Metro's $25 million? I'm the traffic engineer. I'm not building any of it. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe somebody in your team could tell us. Okay. Okay. Is your question about okay. the parking for the mixed use? Um, my question is, is Metro paying for the parking and, and, not getting, and then only getting 50% of the money back? The parking for the mixed-use development is paid for by the developer. The, um, under the SP plan, they meet the requirements, so that's separate from Metro. There will be some parking around the stadium that is part of the stadium project, and the parking on that portion, which under the lease agreement with the sports authority, the team would be entitled to all that revenue, but they have okay. agreed to give up half of that. So I appreciate John being this clear. So we are building parking where the revenue from that parking is going to the team. For non-soccer events, yes. Well, so we, our, us, Metro, our tax dollars is going to building parking. The revenue from that is going to the team and not to Metro. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, so, so there, uh, I do need to clarify that if you're if you're talking about fair events, fairgrounds events that the fair board is putting on, they're entitled to all that parking revenue. What we're talking about is events at the stadium that the team is is overseeing and responsible for. But, but ultimately, we, we, your earlier statement, going back to your earlier statement, we are building parking spaces, and the revenue from the parking spaces that we are building are going to the team. For stadium events, correct. Okay. Um, um, <clears throat> um, all right, and I appreciate everybody's forbearance. So how are we going to cover the cost of the GEO bond? The, it's part, it, through the, uh, their general obligation bonds okay. backed by the full faith and credit of the government, okay. and the debt service will be paid out of the general fund as are all other GEO bonds. Okay. And I see that Talia is not here, but a couple of uh, bond questions. We are preparing to issue, last during the budget season is very clear, about $700 million worth of bonds. This, a couple hundred million dollars more of bonds would take us to about... Well, the two, $225 million is sports authority bonds. Those are not metro bonds. But let's talk a little bit about, I mean, the. The issuer, the market, is going to accept these as Metropolitan Nashville bonds, right? And this is backed by the pledge of the, the revenue bonds of the pledge of the non-tax revenues, Correct. which have been pledged quite a few times right. otherwise, yes, these right? Yes, these would be um, okay. fall in line. Fall in line with that, that, that the funding source and the non-tax revenues that sounds like free money and in fact are going actually to pay for the operations of our government. Correct. Right. Okay. So it's all one revenue service right. and any municipal bond underwriter would look to that one revenue service for the creditworthiness of these bonds. 
So we have a billion dollars of new bonds being issued in the short period of time, okay? And all of us that survived to June are very aware our reserves are what? They're below 5%, right? They're under 3%, billion dollars worth of new paper. This is not guaranteed by the team, right? This is, it's responsible. The team is gonna be responsible for the payments of this, but it is not in any way backed by any credit. It's backed by a, an unconditional team guarantee, and if Mr. Ingram, Mr. Ingram is no longer the controlling owner, right. then it would be with, personal guarantees of the, the owners. The team guarantee, and there are many bankruptcies in sports, the team guarantee, the team really doesn't have any assets. It has its franchise fee, but in the end, we could never call that because you still want a tenant for the stadium, right? You know, it's, no one would view this as being backed by material assets. So my real question is rating. Have you been to the rating agencies? Are you guaranteed that we're not going to be downgraded by a billion dollars worth of bonds coming up in a city that is below its policy on reserve funds? So, so we've, not, we've not been to Moody's and cleared this. We've not, what have we done? Ha haven't done any of that, okay? Okay, um, so, all right, we, I mean, I mean we, we can talk later about this being appropriate. Okay, and I've got numerous other questions, but let me sum up a little bit of concerns that the value of the 10 acres is really quite large compared to the trivial $200,000 payment. You're talking about 69 free years, right, out of this development project. You're talking about a billion dollars worth of bonds being issued in a city that is already credit challenged, right? It is unguaranteed money. There is no site selection process to any degree where the city's investment of a quarter of a billion dollars ends up being shrewdly justified because this is an awesome addition to our tourist space. Right, so the whole concern that the free land in the 10 acres, and I say free, a trivial present value payment compared to the actual zoned land, that the quest for a free land incentive has driven a poor location decision. Now this is separate from all of the other process questions of John changing his opinion about whether the redevelopment required a referendum or not. Um, um, uh, so with that, uh, reserve additional right, but Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm sure everybody is, it would love to hear from another councilman. For the moment, I'm sure we'll be back to you, Councilman Cooper. Uh, Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to thank the, um, the team for being here and just for having this meeting. I think it's very important. And I know a lot of people may look at our I received a lot of emails saying that we should support this. While I think it's good, I do think we do need to evaluate it because time has elapsed, and since then we recognize our city's had a shortfall, and we've just had a couple of different issues that were not the same as it was before. So I, I have a couple of questions, and I just want the listening, I guess, public to understand that, that we may make some different decisions going forward just based on what we just came through with our budget. I mean, it's a totally different uh, climate, and just the, the information as well. And I do appreciate all the council members' questions. I thank you for doing this, because it's, it's really important. I think it's just a different day. So in doing that, I hope no one takes this um, the wrong way, any of the questions that the council members are asking. I wanted to ask about, they, it was shared that there was an analysis. Have we received that analysis of the benefits of having this soccer stadium? Have we received that analysis? I think the, What's the lady? She had shared earlier that there had been an analysis of the benefits of bringing the soccer st uh, stadium and the soccer team to Nashville. Yeah. The, yeah, the financial, uh, yeah, the economic impact study. Have we received that? What, that is it? was shared last fall. That was okay. prepared by Dr. Fox from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Okay, very good. But so we can, we can get another copy. Okay, I would like to have that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's, that's what I was looking for. And then the second piece is you had spoken about the community benefits agreement, but you said we would come back to it. 
I would really like to hear about that. Um, I think it's important in making the decisions um, as we move forward. Like I said, it's not the same climate. And I think what um, Council Member Cooper was getting at with the cultural piece, that would be tied in the community benefits agreements. And maybe if we had a little bit more information about it, it, would, it wouldn't sound so way off. But those things are usually tied into the benefits that a community receives, whether it's something of soccer. I think I think it is a good point, and it doesn't just have to be specifically to Hume Fog, but just any uh, type of benefit to whether it's equipment. Are you are you looking at equipment and starting programs and helping other schools that do not have the proper facilities? Is that something that you're is? Yeah. So you can come to the front there, so I can see your face. So. As we had shared with the council earlier this week that we are in the midst of trying to work through the community benefits agreement, but in order to give folks kind of a flavor of the types of things that we're talking about, obviously everybody's heard about affordable housing, and even last year before this even came up, that that was something that we identified that we would be working on. Um, we know that um, Stand Up Nashville has spent a lot of time and talked to a lot of folks to get feedback on what it is the community wants because this is something that hasn't been done in Nashville. And so part of it is we're learning as we're going. But the three main areas were affordable housing, uh, cultural spaces, and uh, in those areas I think we've talked about we're trying to work through to figure out can we do something with childcare? There's been a request about artisan and entre entrepreneur space. We're trying to investigate that and figure out what that means, uh, how we can do that. As it relates to kind of youth in the community, it ranges from everything to uh, new and used sports equipment to schools and areas so that kids can, can have that. Uh, the U.S. Soccer Federation will work with the team in every city where an MLS uh, club is awarded to put in what they call mini pitches. In addition to that, we're also working on something on our own that we hope we can announce in the near future and would like to try it as a pilot program first, which would be a mini pitch with some programming. Um, it's almost like if you think about taking a tennis court or a basketball court and making it available for soccer in areas where we may not have a, a big enough space to put a full-blown soccer field. Um, and then it also ties into school and education. We're talking about players and coaches being coming, being able to come out and hold clinics uh, around the area to do different things. Um, you know, there's a whole host of a whole host of items. I, I can't tell it, memorize it all from the top of my head. And then we also understand uh, that jobs are very important, and also dealing with the promise zone areas around Nashville, which also include the area around the fairgrounds and how we can figure out uh, ways that we can make sure that those residents that are qualified jobs, qualified for jobs, that we can get them to our places we hold job fairs or as we get further on uh, with the stadium. And so there's more to come on that and we'll be happy to uh, talk about that. I hope that answers your question. Um, it could provide some insight. I just wanted to know, okay, so if the legislation is coming up and for those of us that that is important to, how are we to make a decision if you haven't quite made a decision on where you are and what you will support. So for instance, how committed are you to affordable housing? I do think that that's important. And at what percentage of AMI? We know we have a crisis in the city. So what uh -huh. I would like to say is uh -huh. I am not the expert on housing. Uh, uh -huh. Dirk Melton and Jay Turner were not able to be here today. but. Let us get back with you in terms of those specifics. I know we shared some numbers into the council, and let's get, I'll get somebody who's the expert to be able to respond to that. That's fine. And when do you think you'll reach some type of uh, decision with Stand Up Nashville? Will it be by August the 1st or the 7th or the, and w w when? I don't have a. I mean, not August we, the 1st, excuse we me. We understand. Yeah, the, I'm, just, I'm just talking yeah. in reference to the timeline, the right? The timeline in front of you and the information that many of you f have asked for and what we're trying to do. And uh, as a matter of fact, when we leave this meeting, we're also, we'll figure out when we get that and we know, we understand the urgency of that. Okay, I, I do think that's in, important and I look forward to seeing that. And then also you talked about jobs. Do y'all have the information just as it relates to what your organization will be uh, providing in terms of wages and uh, DBEs and things of that nature? So a couple things that we were just awarded the franchise uh, December 20th. We've just hired our CEO. And so we believe that the team will initially play in MLS in we think it'll be 2020, but we're waiting for the league to confirm that. 
So we're just putting the team together. We're building that out. We, I don't have all those specifics right now, but we are working on that, and we know that we need to be in a position to make some commitments even in advance of our full-blown, you know, you understand it's like a startup business that you're pulling together right now. Okay, yeah, I, I appreciate that. But I do think as we look across um, the, um, as we begin to look across the United States, people are a little bit more transparent with what they're doing and community benefit agreements. While we say this is new to us, but places like Austin, which is our, our peer city, are doing really progressive things in terms of when they incentivize, they look at the wages of those businesses, they incentivize and what they do in terms of um, DBEs, what they do in terms of African Americans in hiring, what they do in terms of communities. I mean, so that is kind of the way that things are moving. And so while it might sound like a far out question, if you look at what's going across the nation, it's, it's just a different time. And so I do hope we can get that information soon, and I hope it's not made light of, and, and, and so that we can make a more we, informed decision. We take it very seriously, okay. and I think it would also be helpful if Monica is still here, that she could speak to the sports authority as we're going through the procurement process for both the architect and the construction manager and the importance of uh, DBE on that. Hello. Well, as, as Mary said, the Sports Authority is in the process of we're getting ready to evaluate the proposals that we've received for the CM. Um, we have set a, a DBE participation goal on the CM of 30 percent, and um, it was 20 percent for the design. And so we are very committed to that. Uh, the Sports Authority as a board has reiterated the importance of that um, at at all of our meetings over the last several months. Um, I know we've had some conversations about it, and it is something that we take very seriously as we um, have conversations with our owner's rep. It is something that we continue to discuss. I had a conversation this afternoon about it, and um, we're gonna make sure it's done right. Okay, thank you so much for that commitment. Also, I had another question too with, I think it's your, your body that does the evaluation of which, uh, person that you're going to allow to de develop, is it the five member, is it the five members that's made up of? Are you, the evaluation panel for the, the CM solicitation? Yes. So um, is there any consideration, I think when we had discussed this before, so I'm just coming back around it to, again, that Stand Up Nashville or someone from there can be on that as well? Oh, the the de you're talking about the, the development, development mm -hmm. committee. Yeah. Um, and, and so your question was, has there been any additional conversation about that? Yes. Um, no, I, and as we talked about it, you know, the development agreement and the development committee that is mentioned, uh, referenced in that agreement, um, focuses on a number of things, and and part of that is looking as we discussed um, change orders and and different uh, more technical things out in the field. Um, we. You know, as we and, I, and we were on the phone with some representatives from Stand Up Nashville. We were, and I appreciate and, your time. And understand um, that there is a, a real desire to make sure that um, safety is is considered by the contractors as we move forward, and that is something else that is one of the criteria that will be used in the evaluation of the CM proposals, looking at their safety history and, and OSHA and some of those things. And so we are gonna be evaluating that, but we'll be looking at it as we um, seek to select a CM. Okay, so it's not an opportunity at this time, perhaps, it sounds like, to add a minute. Okay, and is all this information so far, all the development, is it, it's, it's on your website? Is all of it on the website? The actual documents, mm -hmm. the, every document as it pertains to everything that's going on right they now. They are not on the website, but we are we. They're public, so we'll do whatever we need to do to get those in the right hands. Okay, I would I would like to make a recommendation that we receive those, but also I think it should be on the website. That's a new that's a new part of transparent transparency in government too. Like you go a lot of places, they say it's good. It should be all the deals should be up there so that people can look at it and we can make informed decisions. And just if if third parties like the Brooklyn Institute wanted to look at it and just tell us where where we are on things, I think it's good um, that we that we move towards just having that up on the website so it can be accessed. We and I do thank you for your cooperation. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Thank you, Council A. Large Gilmore, are you done? Councilman Withers. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I, I love hearing the, these discussions from my 
Finance Committee colleagues. I learned so much from that. Um, I am not on that committee, but I am on Planning and Zoning. Uh, and was able to attend the Planning Commission hearing on Thursday. I know a couple of council colleagues were. I just had um, a couple of questions, I guess, from that were raised to me by community members who attended the Planning Commission hearing that I would be interested in hearing uh, a response to, because I, I didn't know the answer to that at the time. But uh, in terms of the um, construction of the new facilities, the new Expo Center facilities, which would take place kind of down the hill, uh, one of the concerns that I heard from uh, flea market vendors was that uh, when we do have flea markets currently, that uh, sometimes if, if it's a good weekend, almost all of the existing surface is used with parking. And there was some concern that during that construction process, when we'd have the new buildings being constructed, they understood that that allows new construction to happen, so we're not closing down the flea market during that time. But there was a concern about displacement of parking, even just from that construction site, and they were uh, they were concerned that that might potentially cause loss of customers. I didn't know if anyone had kind of contemplated that, or if there might be additional off-site parking available, or, or how that lost parking area uh, that would that would be lost during the construction phase would be accommodated. Go ahead. Either one. So today, for a flea market event, for any event on the fairgrounds, there is asphalt surface within the speedway. There is flat surface within the speedway that is not used. So let's assume the new expo buildings are being built. That is another option for us to temporarily park people and have additional, I think we can acquire an additional thousand spots on the flat surfaces within the speedway as a temporary measure. So that's one option for us. Thank you for that. And then, so that would also not conflict with um, Speedway events? Well, obviously, we couldn't use it if, it, if we had a flea market and a speed. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. But that's at least that plan is in place. I appreciate that. Another uh, concern that was raised um, is pertains to housing. And there, the with the mixed use development, um, I think for these, some of the community members, they understood that bringing additional retail or, or other uses to the fairground site does, in fact, have some synergy with even the, the flea market uh, use, for example, having it be a little bit more of a destination for folks who may not ordinarily uh, come to the flea market yet. Um, but there was concern about the housing component. Obviously, we have a housing crunch in our city, but uh, I wanted to see if there were some um, studies maybe from other facilities where have have other facilities been constructed with housing kind of literally as part of the campus of a stadium and how well has that worked uh, i know in district six uh, i receive a lot of kind of noise and congestion complaints from my constituents even about things that happen across the river from district six so i'm very sensitive to how that can be uh, uh, an annoyance for for housing residents sometimes but i just wanted to know uh, had had that been considered with how the housing component would sort of work with with everything else that goes on on inside this campus, I, I was at the. I must confess, I was at the Beck concert, so maybe I'm partly to to, uh, to blame for that. Um, y yes, I mean, if you look, and, and Mary may have some additional information. Obviously, the, the folks from Market Street can talk in a little bit more uh, specific detail about this. But if you think across the country about what some of the most successful stadium developments have been over the last decade or so, um, most of them are actually in um, urban settings with housing around them. Baltimore uh, is one that immediately comes to mind because uh, I was just up there uh, a little while ago. But um, Portland, I think, is uh, is is really sort of a feature of this. Now, the the difference and the benefit maybe some of your constituents don't have this benefit. If you choose uh, to move into an apartment unit right. overlooking a stadium, presumably you've made the choice knowing sort of what you're getting into. Um, and that's not always been the case for, for, for residents um, in, in other settings. And so um, I think there is certainly sensitivity on the uh, part of the development team uh, to address the surrounding neighborhood, which may not have chosen to have a soccer stadium there uh, initially, but we think will benefit tremendously from it. Um, to be sensitive to that, both from, as we heard in the Planning Commission, sort of how the site steps down to the surrounding community, but also uh, how it addresses issues like traffic and others. And uh, Mary, I don't know if you have anything else. 
We'd be happy to pull some information about, especially maybe some of the more recently constructed stadiums. And as a matter of fact, we were in Portland um, just last or the weekend before, and there are literally apartments right across the street from the stadium. And you know, it's been there quite a while. So but thank you. I, I should have said First Tennessee Park, uh, right here in Nashville. Didn't have to go out to Baltimore or Portland, but uh, First Tennessee Park, surrounded by uh, apartments and, and additional apartments uh, being constructed as a part of that development as well. Thank you. Yeah, if we could maybe get some information about other stadium, I'm not. Uh, I have not visited those myself, so I would uh, enjoy learning more about those uh, comparisons. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Withers. And I might take a moment of personal privilege here and add to what you just brought up, Councilman Withers. And there really is no answer here. I'm looking for. I just want to make this public. I really want to know how 900 people are going to live beside a soccer stadium, a racetrack and a flea market every month for three days, and a Christmas village, and a two-week state fair every year. That one's the one that I'm really having a hard time wrapping my head around. So like I said, there's no real answer to that, unless you want to address it, I, Mr. Wilshire. I mean, I've got a microphone in front of me, Councilman. You know I'm going to use it. Uh, <laughs> downtown Nashville just crossed 10,000 residents, and I think when I grew up in Nashville, uh, you wouldn't have told me, you couldn't have convinced me that 10,000 people would have lived in downtown Nashville, particularly with the development of the honky tonks and all the, all the other things. I think it's a broad, diverse world, and some folks like that. Maybe not in District 4 uh, residents, but... Uh, Amen. I understand. Uh, but but, it, but it's a, a broad world with a lot of folks who want to live in a lot of different settings. I appreciate that, Mr. Next up, uh, Council Lady Allen. Wax earplugs. <laughs> You're amazing. You can block out all kinds of noise. A uh, couple of questions back to the affordable housing. J I just want to make sure that as the, either through the CBA or whatever document deals with those, that we also talk about how long those would be affordable for, um, and then hopefully that we can have a, a period more meaningful than five years, something more like 15 or the whole length of the lease. Absolutely. We understand the importance of that and our working probably something closer to the, the lease, or at least Great. half of that term. Great. I'm pleased to hear that. I think that's, I think that's, that's as important as, as what the AMI is. Um, and then many of my questions have been answered, so I'll have to search through to see which ones are still remaining. In, in terms of, um, back to the ground lease, some of the questions that Council Member Cooper was asking, we recently changed our requirements that we had to surplus property before we could do a ground lease on it. So now, at the end of the 99 years, and we've surplused the property, is it possible that the fair, fair boards would have first dibs on getting that back? Because none of us will be here for that. I just want to know what the system is today. The the surplus de declaration is is really just a procedural thing. So at the end of the 99 years, it would it would come back. It would revert back to Metro. And and the fairgrounds. Fair board or whoever is controlling that Correct. would certainly be at least one of the entities to could say we would like that or well, yeah I mean it would automatically go back to them to them okay yes. I think that's that's important to know um, and then on the um, on the on the zoning change on the mixed use development um, just I guess a procedural question the the plan that we've seen before us is very general and um, in general a specific plan ends up being very specific. Will there be a second public hearing for us or an opportunity for the council to um, to see as that design becomes more refined or will that be administratively approved by the planning staff? I'm not sure who can answer that one. Typically, the final site plans are approved administratively. Um, so once the development um, is fully designed, then they would have to go back to the um, planning staff for review and approval. Planning staff, okay. Thank you. Um, and that may be it. Um, let me check. There's, there's one more lurking in here. Okay, back to the scheduling question. You had said that um, the various entities have made commitments to work together to try to adjust if there do end up being conflicts. Is one of those options to say there's currently an MLS game scheduled on Friday, but we know that that's market weekend can we move it to Saturday is there that flexibility to change within dates if it hits on a weekend 
we have not been down that process yet, but we have had some initial conversations with the league and we understand you know, what these dates are in advance. So as we sit down with them and try to work out the schedule in the beginning, we know what we're targeting and um, we know what we've committed to do and we'll make sure that we do that. Excellent, and then I understand and you also have the option to, if you need to, to move some of those times to a different venue. Absolutely. That, um, I think it's up to three times uh, a year that we could play at a different venue, most likely Nissan Stadium, and that could be an option depending on the time of year. Great. It's, it, I mean, I think it's one of the, I think one of the promises we have to make is that we will do everything possible to, to work around the scheduling to ensure that the existing uses can continue to, to function well. And then um, finally, this I think this is an architect question that is similar to one I've asked earlier. Um, of the existing uses, we've talked a whole lot about the flea market, and I continue to forward information that I get from, from flea market folks about their needs and how to make the new space work for them. So I hope that that is continuing to be incorporated in the designs as they get refined. Um, the, the question that has come up most recently is, is again about having a fair. Is the, is the new design compatible with having some kind of fair on that site? Thank you, Councilman Allen. Uh, I, I can't certainly speak on behalf of the, the state fair because we we don't control that from the metro local uh, side. But we're we've considered all stakeholders. We've constantly met with them. We have them at our, our monthly meetings. Uh, keep them involved and, and aware of what's going on. And it's uh, but it, unfortunately, it's up to the state fair um, and their board's prerogative on where to where to have the fair. And and you can continue to feed that information to the architects as they lay things out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Allen. Uh, Council Lady Mina Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for MLS team and you know being in here and try to answer as many questions as you can. Um, let's see. Uh, I have one sp specific question and one general question. Uh, specific question is: Could you? Uh, give me more specific uh, agreement about 4,500 parking space. I am a bit confused. I understand uh, lease uh, annually $200,000 is uh, generated by uh, parking sharing. Uh, so among 4,500 parking spot, uh, who's, which how many of 4,500 is uh, subject to revenue sharing opportunity? So the revenue sharing opportunity is more on an event basis. And so to the extent there would be a non-soccer event, perhaps a concert, then it would be, you know, anybody that comes there and, and parks would be subject to that. If your question was how to determine the 4,500 spaces, I'd turn that over to the parking and traffic expert? Yeah, that would be helpful because uh, the way it sounds like 4,500 parking space is subject to, uh, you know, revenue sharing sounded like 4,500 parking spaces now belongs to MLS team. No, the, the, the spaces, the, um, I think there's a couple different things going on and maybe it might first be helpful to kind of, we could let Chris explain the 4,500 spaces and kind of how they've come up with those numbers because these be are the great. experts Thank you. and I can talk about the other part. Can we, can we go back to the slide that shows the future plan? You'll have to punch it okay. back. Okay. So as we had talked earlier, there are three pods which are the mixed use pods where there is structured parking. So there is structured parking dedicated for some of those residences, but a portion of that will be available for both MLS events or other fairgrounds events. The remaining parking that you see in and around the speedway, inside the speedway when it's available, fair park, around the fair expo center, those are all fairgrounds parking related areas, but they, they can also be used for a MLS event. The only thing that is what I would consider mixed use structured shared parking are the pods that are just what I would consider to the north of the stadium and just east of the stadium, those three development pods. And a certain portion of that parking will be available for both fairgrounds and MLS events. Only that a certain portion will be subject to uh, revenue sharing depending on the events. I'm gonna have to get help on the revenue sharing because I'm, I'm not the guy to answer that. 
The revenue sharing is for non-soccer events, so it's not like one geographic footprint is sort of segregated for one or the other. It's event, soccer events versus non-soccer events. It would be, for example, if the stadium was used to hold a concert and if, you know, 6,000 people came and wherever they parked, those parking revenues, those would be the type that we'd be sharing with the fairgrounds and we'd be happy to share um, our assumptions as we've pulled together how we're looking at that and could get additional information back to the council. Yeah, that would be great because it seems like the line and, you know, who owns what is kind of blood, so I'm kind of literally confused about that. And also, I think earlier, our council member, uh, Cooper asked a very good question. I am a bit, uh, you know, because of the new ordinance, uh, 10 acre will be surplus and then lease. Seems like a surplus and lease doesn't go together. So in that surplus, and then year 99, uh, uh, Mr. Cooper said it's gonna be reverted back to Metro uh, Fairgrounds. So after surplus between, uh, surplus and then between first year and 99, actually who owns it? Seems like if fairgrounds own it and then uh, lease, you know, we are collecting the lease, seems like ownership is not quite clear on that agreement. So from a legal standpoint, a 99 year ground lease is essentially the equivalent of ownership of the ground but the technical ownership of the ground will still be Metro. The structures that are built on top of that ground will be owned by the private developer. At the end of the 99 years, those structures would, would revert with the land back to Metro. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for the clarification. So in that sense, uh, I understand the lease agreement is between uh, year one and year 30. So how does it work? Can we guarantee year 31 through 99? What kind of, you know, if there's, I'm assuming uh, there will be street structure and there will be probably MLS. And so how can we be sure there's some kind of lease agreement or revenue coming from that structure year 31 through 99? Well, uh, Metro will have to negotiate an extension after the 30 years so that um, at the end of 30 years, either uh, for the stadium, either party could walk away. Um, if there is a, nego the extension rent would be negotiated at the time. So that part of that negotiation would include uh, lease payments from the 10 acres. Um, so that, that would all be determined at the time that um, the, uh, stadium lease is up for extension. So in other words, we have to wait until year 31 to- Yes, ma'am. Maybe year 29. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, nobody will be here, so. <laughs> oh, maybe, yeah, Council Lady Murphy might be here. So she will be remind us, you know, we have to renew the lease. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Uh, so one last question is, uh, uh, Council Lady Gilmore asked a community benefit agreement. Who will be in charge and who, how quickly we can be, uh, get those kind of agreement? As I mentioned to Council Lady Gilmore that uh, the team uh, is working on that and we understand the timeline for the council approvals and we will keep everybody informed as soon as we can. Thank you. That will be all. Thank you, Council Lady. Council McGlover. Thank you, Chair. All right, I'd like to go back through a couple of, uh, of different things, if I may. Actually, not go back, but actually get some clarification. Why are we meeting on August 27th? That's not a normal council week. Why are we doing it? I don't really understand why, what, I mean, who lit the match and, and set the barn on fire right now that we've got? Because what is the normal process that we do? If I take a project to planning and I ask to have something rezoned, somebody give me the normal process, if you would, please. I would appreciate that. And I am going to defer that to Acting Vice Mayor Wiener because I believe that was a decision made at an administration level. Uh, oh. Are you on? 
You, you're going to have to be Ed. I am Ed. I'm at Ed's desk. Remember, I normally uh, ah. remember me. Okay. So the administration came to me and asked about the scheduling and the timeline and the ability to offer this special meeting to give us the time to address all of these issues in a public hearing format. And so that's what we presented to, every, uh, to everybody. Um, having said that, I feel like it's important, and thank you for calling on me now, I think it's important that we share with our colleagues and with the public exactly the reason that we are in light of the fact that we have the community benefits agreement not completed and that we've asked for the economic impact study and some other data and we need to do our due diligence. I think it's important that the administration and the team explain why we are under this timeline and what happens if we defer this to give us the opportunity to take that comprehensive dive that the taxpayers expect of us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let, let's go and let's talk about our own rules. It requires a 21-day notice, I believe, in a published uh, publication in a uh, Davidson County paper. Is that correct? Okay. And who delivered that to the clerk's office today for that to be filed and for it to be published? The, the legislation has already been filed. No, I think the legislation has been, but I'm talking about the public notice that, that it has to be in the in a, in a Davidson County newspaper, and there has to be a minimum 21-day notice on that. That is done through the clerk's office. I, um, you would need to check with the clerk's office on okay. that issue. Okay. Well, I, I did, and that's why I'm, I'm asking. That's I just kind of want to find out because I did talk to the clerk's office, and I did ask the question. They, in fact, were notified today so that it will be in the paper Monday or Tuesday next week in time for the 21 days. I think we need to be very aware that we have brought up, I think, some very important and beyond relevant questions that I don't believe we're going to get the answers to, not in a satisfactory manner, because I just don't think we can hash it out that fast. Now, that being said, let's also go back to the timeline of how all of this stuff was done. You had a lot of community meetings in May. I'm kind of thinking in May, there was a bunch of us pretty busy in this room with the budget. And I'm also thinking that, you know, a year ago, we made a promise to our employees that we are not able to, to honor on a cost of living adjustment. But now we're talking about picking up more debt and more debt. What we don't know, and Councilman Cooper, thank you for uh, asking the question on, on the bonds. On the general obligation bonds, that will come out of our operating revenue. So that's additional debt that we're going to have to pay. On top of the $700 million that Councilman Cooper's already pointed out, when you start adding all these numbers up, I don't know that our employees could ever expect to raise going forward because I'm not so sure we can continue the path that we're on right now. So with that being said, one thing that I've heard a number of conflicting issues on, and I, I appreciate the fair commission or the fair board saying that they met with everybody. Do we have somebody here from the state fair uh, group that can talk to us about what our obligations are? Because I heard something at planning the other night from our legal staff there on what they think our obligations are. I would like to understand what they think our obligations are. Chair, if that would be appropriate, if there's somebody here. And Mr. Rose, are you back there? Ah, oh, there he is. Oh, let me see here. Where are you at? Thank you, uh, John Rose, and I'm chairman of the Tennessee State Fair Association. Appreciate the opportunity to speak and address the question. I think uh, if you want to reframe it for me, I would appreciate that. Uh, so I attended, and Chair, if I may, may, may I just address the speaker? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. So the, the, when I attended some of the meetings that I've been able to attend, what I heard from you, what I think I heard from you was, <laughs> based on the configuration that's been proposed here, it's going to be virtually impossible for the fair to operate now, if I misunderstood or whatever, if I could get just clarification from you on that, or how do you see the, the fair operating going forward on this piece of property that I think the number one reason, I mean, it's called the fairgrounds, so I think that probably should be one of the first things we look at 
I don't know if I was clear enough on that, but if not, yes. I'll, I'll be glad to, to clarify it even further. No, I think that's clear, Councilman. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I, I do want to preface this by saying that the Tennessee State Fair Association is not against Major League Soccer, and we are not against um, plans to improve the fairgrounds in the, in the larger sense. Um, and we are and do stand ready to work with uh, uh, planners to try and figure out how to make the fair work on the grounds uh, in light of uh, planned developments. Uh, with that said, that process ha unfortunately uh, really only began last Friday. Uh, prior to that time, though we had tried to communicate the needs of the fair and the requirements for conducting the fair, uh, we had really not uh, been given an opportunity to communicate those, uh, those requirements. Uh, we are now, uh, we now have uh, uh, participated in a meeting and we have provided uh, information uh, about what those requirements would be. Uh, however, as I indicated to uh, the planners, um, as I view the current site, uh, at it, in its current condition, it is barely large enough to accommodate the current footprint of the Tennessee State Fair. Uh, that's without taking away the large parcels of property that uh, this plan would require. And the plans that you see uh, and the facility that you see uh, at this point appear to be uh, completely inadequate to allow us to continue to host the fair, again, at its current level, uh, not at historic levels and not at uh, uh, not assuming any growth in the fair. And so uh, even the current footprint uh, for this year with uh, the property that's being diverted to Fair Park um, frankly presents a challenge that we don't uh, fully understand how we're going to meet. So we were promised that the Fair Park property would be fully available for the 2018 fair. Uh, it appears now that it will not be. And just the absence of that property, uh, of that space, is going to present a challenge. And we really don't, I don't really, as I stand here uh, in front of you today, uh, uh, barely uh, uh, 40 days out from the fair. We're not sure how, how we're going to accomplish uh, the feat that stands in front of us. So uh, I'm going to just say it clearly and try to say it without emotion. Uh, it is my belief, absent some Herculean effort like building a multi-story fairgrounds, um, which would seem to be cost prohibitive, that having these various uses accommodated on the 117-acre site is, is impossible to accomplish. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rose. I believe congratulations are in order, are they not? <laughs> they are. <laughs> Councilman Glover. So, so with that, when, when I look at the timeline, when I look at, and, and basically, this is me walking in as though I'm a child, and I say, hey, Mom, what's for dinner? Doesn't matter, you're eating it. That's kind of the way it feels. And frankly, Mary and Mr. Ingram, I don't blame you, because when it was originally presented to us, it was as though y'all kind of thought it up, but, it, but no, apparently our administration cooked this deal up and then went to you guys. So as things, I begin to unfold and we keep learning more than it, 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 you know, I, I think what Mr. Rose just said, I don't think any of us are against soccer. What I'm against is the way that, and, and what I perceive to be the process and what I perceive to be what the referendum vote was and what I believe the voters were very clear to us on in 2011. That's my real issue. I've never been against soccer. I've also said I won't go. But that's not what I like to do. So that's, that's never been relevant for me. What's been relevant for me is the financial piece of this. What's relevant for me and I, what I believe is relevant for the taxpayers and for all of the people in the Middle Tennessee area that uses this piece of property not only for, quote, the, the fair, and I don't know if there's a lot of folks from out of the county, but I do know there's a lot of people from out of the county who do come in 
and do go to the flea market and go to the Christmas shops and all the other things. So the, the fairgrounds, I mean, I, I think for us to, to say that it's not already generating a positive cash flow, it is. We're not subsidizing that piece of property at all. And so, you know, I, I think we were all very happy when we saw an investment going in a few years ago for improvements. The challenging part now is can we honor and can we do what we said? And I simply will ask this of the acting vice mayor right now. I, I don't think of all the questions that have been brought up at this particular meeting and at meetings in the past that we have sufficient answers to be able to go and with clear conscience either vote for or against it at this point. And so I really fail to understand why we're not following our own process. If I rezone a piece of property in my district, I know what I do at the Planning Commission, I know then when it goes to first reading, and I know the next month is when it goes on the public hearing. But we're not doing that. So again, and I don't really care if I make anybody mad on this, it doesn't look like we're being transparent and it doesn't look like we're trying to be transparent with the voters and with the taxpayers. And so therefore, I mean, for me, this is beyond a challenge. And frankly, you know, while I appreciate the administration may have come and may have said that this is when we want to do this, that's an off week for council members. And for this year, this year, we've spent an enormous amount of time on a number of issues as we will have to next year. And so for those of us who have a job and have to work and have to make a living, when you start taking away more days and more days, just like we're doing right now, and for those of us who do this, uh, that are here right now, we all take it serious, whether you're for it or you're against it or, or you don't know yet. We're here on a Friday afternoon talking about this. So I just don't really understand why we can't follow the normal process on a rezoning piece of property like the rest of us have to live. I don't know of any of us that have asked for a specially called meeting on a rezoning piece or anything else that we do. And if we have, I've simply forgotten it. But I think, I think it shows poor, I think it shows poor judgment on our part on behalf of the people who elect us. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Your Honor, would you like to address any I of that? I would love to. Thank you. So first of all, when this was brought to me, it was my understanding that everything was ready. We have now found that everything is not ready, that there's information we do not have, which is why a few minutes ago I specifically asked for the administration and the team to explain why we are set on this timeline. And I'm waiting for an answer. Hello? Anybody want to take that? The, I'll let the team address the timeline, but from Metro's perspective, the, um, the timeline set out for third reading, uh, first meeting in May was so the uh, new fairgrounds facilities could be built in time for the demolition of the structures and turning over the site to the team. So from the... From an overall timeline standpoint related to the stadium, that when we've committed that we would have the stadium open for the 2021 season, and as you take that schedule and work back on it, that construction needs to start in 2019. In order for that construction to even start, the stadium design process with engaging the architect had to start this year, which it has and also beginning to engage the construction manager. And so right now, and so then the revenue bonds that would be issued would be designed to help pay for part of the cost of the stadium in addition to what the team is contributing to the stadium cost and the 25 million of the general obligation bonds. Because the bonds have not yet been issued, the team had entered into a MOU with the sports authority that we would cover those costs in this interim time frame, And so, to as we've talked to bond experts and others that in order to have the bonds issued this year in the fourth quarter there you run into kind of a timing issue and so which really means that we need to try to get everything approved in September so that they can go through that process. So would the world come to an end if we deferred it a month to give everybody more time to do their due diligence appropriately would that kill it for 2021? 
Sherry, I don't know the answer to that, and I'd have to go back and talk to others because we're not the ones issuing the bonds. Mr. Cooper. Rich. What, I, I don't know the answer as far as the, the issuance of the bonds, but what what questions um, would the, do you need answered that, that you you don't have? So get that, then we'll from, from just sitting back here and listening, I'll do respect to everybody in the room. Sitting here for the last couple hours and listening to the questions, you've got the economic impact study that Council Lady Gilmore wants to take another look at. J you just real have, quick, that was provided in the fall, but we'll send right, it out. We can do that in just a minute. I know. You have the community benefits agreement that's not completed. We have other pro formas that they were going to provide to us that we don't have. Um, and so in order to do our due diligence and to the point that A, we're part-time and B, one of the things that we've had some concern about over time is the fact that we get these proposals to us and we have these short time frames and yet we're part-time and we need to make sure that we are, do our due diligence for the taxpayers appropriately. So I'm not suggesting that we kill the deal today. I'm suggesting that we have a good hard and fast reason why we're not just delaying it to do our homework more comprehensively so that we, we make the decision, we make the appropriate decision, not only for Metro, the team, but most importantly, the taxpayers. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Um, Chairman Benet, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I mean, we have three different TV stations right here. We are being online. People are going to watch us on Channel 3. This is not a secret meeting that we are having. We are being very transparent. We are sharing information with people. This meeting didn't need to happen. It was called. Uh, the chair decided to call this meeting so we could have more transparency. So um, with all due respect, Councilman Glover, to say that we are not trying to be transparent is doing a disservice to the very people that are here today trying to answer all these questions. So I will ask people not to uh, start talking about lack of transparency when this very effort right here is to try to provide more transparency and to give people the opportunity to answer questions. Some of the questions the Vice Mayor just asked, she can ask them because we are having this meeting, because we are, I think, there is a commitment to transparency. So I know it seems to be now uh, an effort in the city to talk about us being secretive, I think that does a disservice to the bigger picture, which is that we have institutions here that we are representing. We are the people, right? We are representing the people. If we keep repeating this idea that we are not transparent when we are actually being as transparent as we can ever be, I think it's doing a disservice to our democracy. So I was just trying to bring up that point. Thank you. Councilman Glover. And let me be very, uh, very clear with all due respect. It's not a question of us being transparent. When we're changing the process, when we change our normal process, then it looks like we're trying to pull something. Now, I don't care how we slice or dice it. That's what it looks like. And so that's just the way it's being perceived in the public. And you know what? Perception is reality in this issue. That being said, uh, I still don't really understand why, uh, you know, w because there are still a lot of things we don't have. With all due respect to you, Matt, the, the economic study we got was based on the what was presented to us last year. I believe the deal has changed the, considerably. Yeah, the, the deal has actually not changed considerably. There are a number of improvements, but the economic impact was based upon, I mean, so before, I think it was a, 27,500 seat stadium, now it's a 30,500 seat stadium. So there's 3,000 more seats, which would provide for your, and you have been very diligent on this point. You know, what's Metro's financial exposure? We now have more seats, which means more sales, which means more sales Hopefully tax. more. Hopefully more, maybe not. You're right, maybe not. The, the, the team is the one who's bearing the, the cost of building a bigger stadium. They're doing that because the demand drivers for seats are uh, exceeding expectations. And therefore, we believe we have more protection. But a lot of the economic impact was based upon assumptions about the construction, construction costs, economic impact of the construction itself, sales taxes generated, jobs provided for people in the construction of the stadium, and then the jobs provided for people in the ongoing operations of the stadium. And those things other than maybe being 
slightly higher because we're going to be selling more Cokes, shirts, and hot dogs. Uh, the economic impact is greater, not lesser. And, and, and so, but, but you're right, we, we, we owe you that, we will get that uh, to you. But all. the study that we were presented was not, is not the way the deal is today. I mean, what, what, what we, I mean, the, the number of, uh, of units, hotel, I mean, I thought it's increased. And, and, and I mean, I, at, at the risk of sounding rude on this too, based on what uh, Councilman Cooper brought up, the, the value of the deal probably has increased drastically. But we, we don't really know that. And so, um, that, so there have been some things that, I mean, that where it's going to be done has changed. Yes. And, 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 and you're absolutely right. And, and that's the reason we're having these meetings. I mean, you, you mentioned an unusual process. This three-hour meeting is an unusual process, and I will work with you as I have continued to work with you on every. I'm, I'm talking about the timing. To share all okay. the information with you. Yeah, let's be very clear. I just don't understand why we can't follow our normal process on this. We don't have answers to a lot of questions that have been asked here, and so um, from from that, I don't like when we, because you guys always do walk in here and tell us, well, y'all approved this, you did this. Yes. And the thing, the thing that we also did as a body is we promised a cost of living adjustment. We, this body promised it. To and then we took it away. And so when we're gonna talk about honoring our word and all the other things, that's a two way street for everybody involved. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. And, and just to be clear, there was never an expectation that we would have every answer by this meeting. It, the, specifically, the purpose of this meeting is to answer all the questions we can. We want to narrow the list down. But we really want to get the questions so that when we come to the budget and finance meeting and the codes and the fair meetings, all those meetings that happen in two weeks, that we can answer your questions. And so that is our responsibility. I'm not saying we're going to answer them in a way that's satisfactory to every member. There may be p folks who just say, look, I don't really want Major League Soccer. I don't like this deal, and we understand that, but it is our responsibility to get you the answers. We didn't, there was never an expectation that we would have all the answers today, because we're still just working through it all. And, and so if we don't get you the answers, we, we can absolutely talk about changing the, the schedule. Well, and, and the other thing, and let me just say this, I mean, we're all of a sudden adding, uh, I mean, we're adding another meeting. Uh, on a non-council day. And Councilman Glover, so, let me, you go. if you don't mind, Councilman. Uh, and this is an administration question. I think the administration requested us have an additional council meeting on the 27th to hold the public hearing on this particular subject right. because I think we all know this is gonna be a four or five hour public hearing. And if we do that in the middle of a regularly scheduled council meeting, we will literally be here till three in the morning. And, and, and I get that piece of it, but that's also gonna be now second reading. And so, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I disagree with it. I just don't understand why, you know. Ca so Council anyway. Councilman, thank yep. you. I've got seven yep. people yep. left there in the queue. Go. We've got 30 minutes left in this meeting. And quite honestly, since we are under the time frame that Councilman Glover just so eloquently put, uh, if we go past six o'clock, I'm willing to stay as long as this takes. So with that said, Councilman Freeman. I was, I don't use this enough. It was kind of stuck. Um, thank you, Chair. And thank you, ownership group. I know um, they're going to they're gonna be some heated, uh, some tempers. And it's just, I think, more probably passion, because I think you have to have passion to do this job. Because we go out to our communities, and we have to answer for all of these proposals that the administration comes up with. And, and all these questions, all the stuff that has changed or perceived to have changed since the last meeting. So we're, we're going to have... Some tough questions. So if it's, I, I don't want you to think that we're, you know, specifically attacking you guys, specific, but we have to answer these questions. Um, and I want to get to parking. So if you want to go back to the favorite slide there, we can go right to it. And the parking engineer, if you would. Right now, where you you said there's 4,500 available spots current. Yes, sir. Okay. Right now, our fairgrounds, when the fair is in full motion, I'm sorry, the flea market is in full motion on any given Saturday, the end of the month, we are using almost all of that space right now to park. And with this proposal, uh, uh, Matt, the one with the, the different uh, blue, yes, sir. 
Um, and with this proposal, we're moving the fairgrounds or the expo centers to the top left, and the parking is going to be just to, I guess that would be the west of those buildings, correct, for the fairgrounds, for the flea market and such? That is one of the spots, yes, sir. Do we know, okay, and these other spots that we have, you said are mixed-use parking? No, the other blocks, the other blocks down in the 10 acres? You, no, the only spots that are mixed-use are the three that are to the north and the northeast. <laughs> There's three pods of mixed-use. Someone's got a point, yeah, it won't, probably won't point on that plasma on that. screen. Yeah. But. We weren't here prepared, okay. <laughs> So I, I guess, let me just get to it. I guess with losing so much space to the mixed use and the stadium itself, just the physical buildings itself, how do we plan to park all of the flea market vendors? Because those vendors, they don't show up in um, Priuses. They've got, right. you know, the big trucks and the long 32 foot trailers because they bring in their wares. How are we gonna park them on the site? And then also expect everybody from the surrounding counties and that go to the flea market. How are we gonna park those on the site? We'll park them on the site with all the additional spaces that we have. We've had to find additional spots within the footprint to house both vendors as well as those of us who like to go to the right. flea market. Do we, do we have an idea what, what additional parking spaces we're adding? Are we still sticking at 4,500? We, we will maintain 4,500 with a potential for that to gain as we look more in depth with the mixed use. But the goal is what we operate with today, this plan will provide that as well. well okay, well, okay, all right. Um, and I'm assuming the 900 uh, unit apartments, those are gonna have their own dedicated spaces? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. We've ran a model to determine which, of, which portion of that mixed use structured parking will be available for both MLS as well as a fairgrounds event. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, yeah, parking is a hot topic today. Understand. Um, and so I want to get back to this uh, CBA and the schedule that we're on. Do we have a, a commitment from the team that this CBA will s find some agreement prior to final reading? That's what we're working on because we understand that we need to be able to talk about that before you, yeah. everybody here has the final votes and we understand the significance of it to each of you here as well as to other members in the community. So is that a yes? I'm looking for a now, yes. Now you know that I can only control <laughs> one side of what we're doing. A agreements right. take two parties. I can't control the other party, but we are committed to do what we can to get something done. Okay. Um, and in that community, uh, that CBA they're talking about, um, one question that, is, I mean, our cell phones have just been going off with the text messages, is the living wage agreement. Are you guys committed to providing a living wage agreement? This isn't really the forum for us to be commenting on that right now. And so when we get through that agreement, we'll be happy to share the details that are in that. Well, I'm, 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 I am, I'm trying to put you on the spot. Um, so that's why, and I feel like- I appreciate <laughs> you putting me on the spot, but I'm not gonna answer that right now. That would not be appropriate. Okay, all right. Um, we'll move on. All right, after the 10 years, the four, uh, Matt, if you wanna take over, the first uh, five years were on for 4 million. The next five years, we're on for three million. Is there any commitment after that? No, sir. There is no commitment at all. So, I mean, if you think about it, presuming that things tend to, you know, get better as teams get more traction, you know, the risk is really diminished significantly over time. But, but actually, let me just answer your question. No, there is zero. Oh. At that point, rent has to cover the full amount, and there's no payback from the city right okay um let's on the minimum all right on the four million and the three million uh that we are committed to the ticket sales hot dog sales t-shirt sales does the first four million dollars of sales go to cover metro's liability or do we have to hit a mark and then you know we we ratchet up yeah so so just to be very specific because I, I feel like I, I haven't done a good job about being clear about this so there will be a, a ticket tax I mean it's a tax about word, but there will be a dollar 75 on each ticket sold the full value of the ticket goes to the team the buck 75 goes to to offset Metro's liability so you got to sell a bunch of tickets 
and you got to sell uh, a bunch of hot dogs and cokes and actually they're going to have better food than that here i think they're going to have uh food that appeals to folks who like to attend soccer games so whatever uh that has but there needs to be adequate sales taxes not the value of the food but the sales taxes on the food the jerseys and other sorts of things and th that adds up uh and as you heard earlier if they are at 87 percent of capacity then metro is four millions covered um, but that's what it is yes the first four million Okay, yeah, I just, I guess I got caught up in the shirt sales and the hot dogs. And sorry, like that. sorry. Um, all right, right now, uh, back to the parking question as far as the, the pricing of the parking. When we, when the soccer game is on, parking is for soccer, correct? We're collecting ticket, we're collecting parking fees for the soccer stadium, correct? That is correct under our lease agreement with the sports authority. All right, if, um, if the fairgrounds is in action, are we allowed to use uh, the soccer stadium parking? Assuming there's no game. So if there's not a soccer game there and if there's a fairgrounds event, the team is not collecting those parking revenues unless it was something that was a stadium event such as a concert or anything. But if it's a fairground event, it would run the way it does today. Okay, so we'd still be able to use those those additional spots. Not, not talking about the mixed use spots, but like the specific stadiums spots that are expected to be behind the stadium that would be available for fairgrounds events okay that's good because i was thinking you know if you go to the annual plant sale which i'm a big fan of it costs five dollars to park if i've got to pay thirty dollars to park to go buy my annual plants i'm probably not going to go every year so that's good to know that when the soccer team is not the soccer team is not collecting the rents or the parking um i think that is it i don't know i think let's see yeah i think that's it uh thank you chair thank you guys so much um and thanks for all your time Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think everybody knows, but just for the audience's purposes, I represent the district that was uh, described as, from one council member as a poor location decision. So I want to speak a little bit to that. But first, I wanted to ask legal. Um, under the charter, I'm trying, because we talked a little bit about the fair. Can you speak a little bit to what we're required to hold regarding a fair? So the, the original private acts that were incorporated into the charter when the charter was adopted in 1963 reference a divisional fair. Um, back then, you had three divisional fairs, one east, one middle, one west. Um, so so it, it's a kind of an undefined divisional fair. The referendum language that the voters approved specified the Tennessee State Fair. However, subsequent to that, the General Assembly preempted Metro and took the rights to the Tennessee State Fair and the responsibility for putting on the Tennessee State Fair. So if the Tennessee State Fair decides not to hold their fair at the fairgrounds, Metro would still put on a divisional fair. To be compliant with the acts that Correct. you just described. Okay, I just wanted to be clear about that. There was a lot of conversation that was brought up about similar deals or deals that have occurred from MLS. And thankfully, because I am a soccer fan, I'm somewhat aware of, of these plans. So regarding the plan with Cincinnati, um, Cincinnati actually came together fairly quickly but was behind us. Um, and I think to some embarrassment for some Cincinnati fans that they got beat out by Nashville for getting an MLS squad first. Um, what happened with Cincinnati's council agreement, yes, there's $34 million that the city um, was contributing for infrastructure. But as you'll remember, we are a consolidated city-county government. Cincinnati is not. So Hamilton County is contributing another $40 million over the agreement with this stadium from parking revenues and other sources. And on top of that, the state of Ohio is contributing an additional $4 million to the team. So you're talking about $78 million of public funds that are going to a stadium that is 21,000 seats. So you're talking about a stadium that is a third smaller than the stadium we're talking about for Nashville, contributing more public funds than what's published now. And this is all out there. I'm doing the research while we're sitting here talking. Um, the bond rating compared to Cincinnati, we have the same bond rating, the same Moody's bond rating as Cincinnati. And so you're looking at a plan from a city that did a plan after ours, by the way, without a CBA in place. Now I am committed, because I'm the sponsor of this legislation, I'm committed to us having a CBA in place before we take our final votes on this issue. Uh, but Cincinnati did their deal, 
without a CBA finalized, when they finalized that, it was valued at $6.2 million over 30 years, so a little more than half a million dollars, I think, um, over that 30 years. So comparing all of these issues, I think, is a little difficult. I did want to note the $35 million that goes to the school system in Cincinnati was due to a land swap that had to occur. So in essence, the city, uh, the school system needed to agree to have a land deal with the team. And when they did that deal, they did $35 million. The revenues that come into the fairgrounds as a result of the mixed use development proposal are valued at something like $1.1 to $1.3 million a year. Over the 30 years those are paid, that's somewhere around 35 to $39 million. So I take a little bit of issue for saying that there's some sort of weird shenanigans or chicanery that's going on with this deal when this deal compares favorably to a deal done after the deal that we're talking about. So that's the Cincinnati comparison. There's one other question that I would like to ask of the team because I do have questions associated with these. There's a practice facility that's often associated with Major League Soccer teams. The practice facility for FC Cincinnati went to another county which means another county is getting $6.7 million of revenue a year in economic impact uh, that Hamilton County in the city of Cincinnati isn't getting. So what I want to ask the team is that when they're considering their practice facility siting, is it your intention to place that practice facility in Davidson County? Absolutely, that we've been so focused on the stadium and hiring our CEO, we haven't even gotten to that part yet, but we know that there's plenty of opportunity around Davidson County that could be a suitable practice facility and we're committed to try, you know, that's the first thing that we will be looking at to see if we can find something that will work for that. Yeah, okay, well, I, I appreciate that. On the topic of site selection, so I know that there's been issues about asking why this site was selected, and I'm gonna be, I don't think it's gonna come as any surprise that I want this to happen in the district that I represent because I think it has a very positive impact. Um, other, since other cities where they've gone through MLS right now, Cincinnati had to rescind their original legislation that they passed because they put it, they wanted to put it in a community where the community later said no and said that they were not engaged. I live in the community next to this site. I think I would know if I heard that the community didn't want it. Instead, community members came out and spoke for it at the planning commission meeting, and they continued to tell me that they want to see it. In Miami, where they're continuing to hold votes and continuing to try to find sites, they're on their fourth site because of the dysfunction that they have within their ownership group, and they continue to add owners who want to move. I think it's a huge benefit that we have an ownership group that is united in their vision for this site, for this stadium, and for this city. And then finally, Austin, which is about to take a vote to whether they will put a stadium on public land, they are on their second or third site, depending on what you want to call the discussions that they've had, and they are having very, very similar discussions as to the ones we're having. Um, regarding transparency, I really take issue, and to Councilman Bedney's point, when we've had five public meetings on four days in May, very well publicized, hundreds of people who attended. In, November, in fall of last year, we held a public hearing about the vote that we then voted 31-6 on when a public hearing wasn't even required under our rules because it was a resolution. We held a public hearing because this council feels it's important to be transparent, and I maintain that we are being transparent. We've had two committee, meeting, committee meetings, including this one, and to the point about scheduling, I wanna talk about that a little bit. As you know, there's a bill package that we have that has all different kinds of bills, including a GO bond resolution that is on the agenda for this Tuesday. Obviously, I do not wanna move a GO bond resolution, I don't think Council Lady Vircher would want to either on Tuesday. We have bills that take three readings that don't require public hearings, and then we have a bill that takes three readings and does require a public hearing. They have different vote thresholds. So what I think the best option is, is for us, as was articulated, to have a night where we dedicate it to speaking about what is clearly an important and, I mean, multi-generational decision that this body is gonna have to make. To me, moving it to another night shows that we know that it's pretty daggum important and that we need to give every opportunity to the city and to its uh, members to be able to have that discussion. 
And finally, I know that there's a question about event protection. Um, and I, my understanding is, I'm asked the team, I'm asked legal, when we talk about protecting events like the flea market or Christmas Village or these specific dates, my understanding is that is an agreement to be worked out within this, between the sports authority and the fair board or the team of the fair board. Who makes that kind of in writing agreement? That's what I'm trying to ask. Well, the, the stadium operation agreement will be between the team and the fair board. So that, that will be a written document that will address scheduling issues and how scheduling is handled. The team lease that is with the sports authority addresses scheduling and scheduling conflicts and how those are resolved and the requirement that the parties work in good faith to resolve those. Part of the reason for having the advanced scheduling um, provided to each side is so that these can be worked out on the front end so that you don't have conflicts. And have any or all of those agreements been created, signed, finalized yet? No. Okay. So we, so we still have the opportunity is what I'm hearing right. to get those protections in. Okay. Well, and, and one, just very last thing, I know I said it was the last thing, so it's a question about housing and putting housing next to these uses, and I know that there's some concern. I don't want to belittle any of that concern. I think we are well aware of the housing need that we have in our city. If you drive down Wedgwood right now, they're in the second phase of construction of new townhomes that I sure as heck can't afford that are going literally, literally right next to the fairgrounds property. In order to enter the property, the fairgrounds property from Wedgwood and Rains, you have to drive past those townhomes. So people are making the economic decisions right now to say that they are willing to live next to those uses, both current and potentially future. Chairs, thank you for the time. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Mendez. Thanks. Um, I think I've got uh, more questions and less speechifying. Um, so I'm going to, I think a lot of them are to uh, Legal Director Cooper, um, and so I'm going to knock out hopefully some pretty easy ones. Of the legislation, is um, all of it amendable on third reading, um, or is the lease one not amendable on third reading? The lease is not the ticket tax. I think under your rules that would be a tax measure, so that would be the zoning bill is... Um, but right, the ground lease one would not be. So we'd have to know that the ground lease one is only amendable on August 18, not on right. September 4. Um, all right, the, uh, uh, I'm not sure who the right one for this is. Who are going to be the parties to the community benefits agreement? Currently, it's Nashville Soccer Holdings and Stand Up Nashville. And is Stand Up Nashville, not to lawyer everybody, but is that like an actual legal entity? We understand, we've asked for those documents. We understand that um, I'd have to check with our legal folks. I think it was just recently incorporated, but we've not seen the information yet. It, we, we understand the implications of needing an entity to enter into an agreement with. All right, thanks. This uh, operations agreement that you all have talked about today between the team and the fair board, is, are we going to get a copy of that before we do our voting? We will have a term sheet that will be available for the fair board to be approving at their next meeting, and we'll be happy to make that available to everybody here. And I gather that's not subject to council approval. Um, uh, I would join Council Lady uh, Allen's comment about needing to, when we talk about the affordability going forward, um, just telling us 10% of the units is not helpful. Uh, I mean, I appreciate the direction and I know the details aren't set, but we need to know the affordability level and the period of affordability. And then um, question that I, I guess I'm a little confused by, it seems like the easiest way to make that enforceable is to put it as a condition to the SP. And I'm wondering whether there's an intention to make it a condition to the SP for the zoning. Do you want to answer that? Councilman, mm. by, I think by state law we can make affordability a condition. Of no, that's, that, um, we, uh, we I, the, the, even if the team vol volunteered? The team can voluntarily do right. it. it. It would not, it would have to be noted as a, a, a voluntary mm. action. It, it could not be, a, it would not be an enforceable condition by the government. It, under state law, it can't be. Non-binding, but the, the team could. I mean, 
the team could voluntarily agree to do you know X number of units at whatever AMI as a, as um, uh, and and the team could volunteer to have it in the SP. Right. I think what you would probably do is have a separate letter of agreement from them that you make a part of the record or incorporate, you know, um, along with the S SP. Um, I would, would not feel comfortable making it a condition of the actual ordinance, but incorporating it into the ordinance and referencing it in the ordinance is something that could be done. And so long as it was the team's idea to have it have maximum enforceability that would have Metro being the counterparty rather than stand up Nashville the counterparty on the affordability I would have to think through that but that that sounds right but I would, I would have to think through that further all right I mean I, I would like y'all to to work through that because that the especially since the team has been so clear about its um, interest from the beginning of of insisting that this be uh, the affordability be part of it it is I think already a clear record and we could continue to make it clear that it's um, something that they were volunteering to do and I think um, uh, it's stronger for the city if the current counterparty is Metro to that voluntary obligation rather than stand up Nashville. Um, so I'll leave that to y'all to think about. Um, on the sales tax, um, I have in gathered that it's the sales tax from the stadium proper that are being um, snagged for financing. It's the sales tax from the stadium as well as sales tax on team merchandise oh, yeah, the that merchandise would be sold in the as, county yeah and, and if they had a a team store at the private development or something that would would fall under but it's it's primarily the stadium all right and that i know is um that was spelled out in the resolution and is that going to just then be propagated into bond documents it's in the, the state law that mirrored what the, the okay. state state law said. Um, the I, I know it's been said repeatedly that the new expo space is going to be built before the existing expo space gets torn down. I didn't see that in any of the legislation. It's the last uh, recital clause of the um, demolition ordinance. So, I mean, states it's it's a statement of intent that before anything is um, torn down, that that the new buildings be ready uh, to move in. So I'm going to ask that uh, when we get to it, that that one be amended to take it out of the recital into the actual resolution language, because I think the actual resolution language doesn't reference um, you know, when we say, therefore, it is hereby resolved, um, I don't think it's included in that language. And so, I mean, it, I'll take that up again when it comes time to amend that. Um, uh, I've, uh, this is for the, Mary, um, I've just, I'm assuming sort of maximum attendance for a regular season of soccer is about um, 500,000 or so total. 17 games, 30,000 people. That's probably directionally right. I'd ha we've got models that have all the numbers. I just don't have them all memorized. Okay. Um, and um, does anybody in the models have a projection of long the cost of long-term capital improvements? And I just mentioned that because there's, there's been some news recently about uh, improvements at Bridgestone and in today's dollars, the cost of building it was roughly the same as a stadium, and 20 years later, it's a you know 150 million or so is the projected capital improvement need. So I'm just wondering if anybody's got modeled out the long-term capital improvements needs for the stadium. So under our lease agreement with the sports authority, and I don't understand what all the other existing lease agreements are, that there's certain items that are more repair and maintenance that in our case the team's responsible for instead of the city and the city's portion is truly capital expenditures. Um, also, I'd have to understand the difference between a soccer stadium and some of these others. And I can tell you that as we've modeled 
the, uh, under this case, what's also different is the ticket tax increases in future years and the increase is used to create a designative, designated capital expenditure fund, reserve fund, so to speak, and over 30 years, I think the value of that is close to $14 million, whereas in these other stadiums, there's nothing. Well, for Bridgestone, for many years now, there's been a $2 per ticket for capital improvements, which is more than the 75 cents. I'd have to defer to somebody at the city that had shared that information. I mean, there's a there's a ticket tax that's not used for capital improvement, and then there's another $2 per ticket charge. Um, and uh, as I understand it, um, that um, uh, secures a $10 million line of credit. And um, I think right now the balance is about $7 million. Um, and so they're s spending that um, money uh, I guess faster. They borrow. They used it as collateral to borrow against. Um, so um, that's why I'm asking. Uh, so does it? I mean, I guess that's a um, don't know whether there's a modeling out for the long-term capital improvement cost. I mean, at this point, we don't have the conceptual design of the stadium completed yet. We have an estimated cost, and so until we go through that process to even know what it costs, I don't think we could go and identify what the future expenditures would be. Okay. Um, some, there was a mention of uh, we'll use off-site parking. Um, uh, where is the off-site parking? Chris. So we preliminarily looked at both a half-mile radius, a one-mile radius, and a two-mile radius from the stadium. And we, as we look at those, we look at viable public and potential private partners for off-site parking. That number gets us to 21,000 possible places when we get out to a two-mile radius. So within a half mile, that's literally where my office is at the boot factory, you know, at the corner of Ransford and Craighead. When we get to a one-mile and two-mile radius, we're potentially looking at shuttles to get our patrons to the actual stadium. For the shorter radius, are you running any sort of filter for whether there's sidewalks to that location? Part of our study, we will look at sidewalk gap and figure out where those exist in the project vicinity, yes, sir. Um, okay. Uh, I think there's, oh, also on parking, you mentioned uh, being able to uh, park temporarily on the asphalt and the racetrack. Um, is that something the tenant has consented to? We have. And, and is their, their consent needed? We've had this discussions with the fairground staff in terms of the availability to do that and when it's available. So yes, we've had those discussions. Has the tenant consented? The tenant being? The, the, the people that operate the racetrack. Tony Formosa. I, I don't know that answer. I think that, that I don't know. All right. I think Laura was unable to be here this afternoon. I think that's one that she can be able to answer right. that firsthand. Um, and uh, I, I guess the, while somebody's asking her that question, um, it, it I mean, I don't know whether their consent is necessary. Um, so it's, it's really two parts. Are there, is their consent necessary? If so, have they provided it? And uh, uh, that's all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. And Eureka, Council Lady Murphy, thank you for being so patient. I try my best. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, by I'm, the way, we're done. Oh, don't you even. Don't you even. So Please I've go got, right ahead. I've, <laughs> thank you. I've got a number of questions. Um, if they are more than like a couple of sentences of explanation, I'm happy to type these up and email them in to whoever I should email them into and coordinate through our office. Um, first, how many non-soccer events do you anticipate each year? Um, I guess is that like, is, is, I know that we have the option to do them, but like on an average year, on a good year, on a bad year, do we have that information or can it be sent to us? We'll be happy to send that information to you. We don't have specific plans, but we have some estimates. And like we mentioned, we're really gonna be focused on soccer in the initial years of building out the club, but happy to get that for you. Okay, great. Don't want it to be sitting empty. The racetrack. Um, so when we're talking about parking um, on the, I, I, I'm not the the biggest um, racetrack fan. So are we talking about the like the middle of the area doing extra parking there? Is that like inside the track? 
So obviously in the corners it's banked, so we won't be parking in the, in the corners, but there's a potential to park on the flat straightaway surface as well as the potential infield. And who is liable for any damage done to that racetrack or having to repave the racetrack if the, I mean, I assume that parking would, parking lots have to be repaved, that kind of thing. What, how does that play out? I think we'd have to get back with you on the answer with that. But okay, I'm so let's, let's definitely try to find that out. Um, flea market and competition. So the mixed use retail in this area, um, I think that we all appreciate the uniqueness of our, of, our, of our flea market and when we have our herb swaps and things like that. What are the guarantees that our vendors that currently use those opportunities will not be put out of competition by the retail and mixed use retail in the area? So I would get somebody from Market Street to be able to respond to that question. You know, there's nobody's even been contact. You know, we're still early in the planning. It just got approved by that, but we'll be happy to respond to you on that. We understand Great. the question. Great. And, and just, I mean, just talking conceptually here, I mean, obviously a flea market is a very different offering from sort of an in-store retail. Um, and as we've thought about it, and Caleb, I don't know if you want to add anything to this. I mean, we really see that as a complementary uh, rather than competitive. The flea market exists today in the midst of Nashville, broadly speaking, where there are many retail options. So we think by adding proximity and additional services, it makes it more attractive to attract more consumers to the flea market, which is one of the things we're excited about. Um, so rather than being competitive, we think that it will actually be complementary. But you know, I, I mean, I guess you know, I guess, I guess it's possible that everyone would show up and no one would go to the flea market and just go to the right. retail. Right. If there's just some resources or something, because yeah. I know as. I do not want to speak for Council Lady Dow, but I know that she's had some concerns in the past, voice over the farmer's market and, and who's a vendor there and who's not and that type of thing. So if there's any resources out there, please send them to us. Um, I, I have not gotten a chance to read our analysis yet, uh, but I'm hoping that in there there is some more breakdown about the ticket taxes, um, what is allowed by the state, what's not allowed by the state. I know personally that when I'm buying my, my TPAC tickets, and then I get hit with the processing fee and I get hit with the ticket fee and I get hit with all that, all of a sudden my $36 ticket is now 45 and I'm rethinking my purpose or my purchase of that. So if we can get a, a make sure that that's clear in our council agenda or anything we can get from the administration. Parking prices, right now when I park at the uh, flea market, I think I'm paying what, about $5? Um, what would it be like on a game day? Because when you go to the Titans game, you can pay anywhere from somewhere where you up here on a street or down there for a whole lot more. Um, if there's some kind of information that the the, the soccer team and all of y'all could to get to us more about what you expect those ticket parking prices to be. Um, because what my concern is too, is I don't want us to get three years into this and I'm not going to the flea market because I don't want to pay $20 for, for parking. I know that some of that's been touched on. We can get some more information on that in writing. But Councilwoman, re real, I think that's an important point. I just want to clarify, make sure we're clear on this. The, the, and, and please, someone correct me if I'm wrong on this. The, the team is not setting the prices on the flea market, right? J just to be 100% clear, the team is setting parking prices on soccer events or selected other events in the stadium that they would be controlling if there so were a the concert. the rest of that will be continued to be controlled by the fair board? 100% okay, right. by the fair board, no change at all, not an impediment at all. So we as council members still can have some influence through the fair board on that, great. Scheduling, um, factor myth type of thing, I guess here, we can make sure we get that in writing and clear to us. I know that we've touched on it a number of times and some of it's gonna be a wait and see, but I've had uh, constituents reach out saying that ESPN is going to now be controlling the, the scheduling for, for everything at the fairgrounds. I know that can't possibly be true because I don't think that they want to start scheduling our, our um, car swaps and things like that. Right, that, 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 would, that that's would correct. be correct. Okay, just checking. Um, the State Fair, uh, as, as many of y'all know, I am a State Fair ribbon winner. The State Fair has a special place in my heart. I want to make sure that we are not, I, it feels like we're getting a little late to the table to bring them in. Um, if we just started meeting with them last week, w w I hope that means that y'all are meeting much more frequently now. Uh, there was mention of we continue to have a divisional fair. We currently do not have a Davidson County divisional fair. We are doing a disservice to our to the, the youth and, um, and Nashvillians by not having the fair. I'd love to see those competitions come back because the fair is not just about the rides and it's not just about the competitions. It's everything involved there with it. So um, just wanted to get my plug in there that before we get to third reading, I would 
I really need some more um, certainty about the state fair arrangement um, and that type of thing. Because just defaulting to say, well, we'll just start having a regional or divisional fair, I, I need more information there. So I hope that y'all can provide some of this in writing. I'm happy to resubmit these um, via email. And thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Council Lady. And again, thank you for your patience. Uh, there are three people left in the queue, and all three of you have spoken before. So, DaCosta, do you want to speak again? Yes. Councilman Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I just uh, really quickly, and uh, speaking after the blue ribbon winner, uh, I want to know what you won. <laughs> Cowbell. <laughs> Cowbell. <laughs> all right. But I, I just wanted to uh, come back. Uh, it is on parking again. Uh, I, I think Metro has done a disservice to itself because we find ourselves in, in situations to where we're building parking garages and lots and all of that stuff, and then later we end up paying for it. Uh, it's, it's a prime example, Metro General Hospital. We pay $99 a spot per, per parking spot, and we built it. Um, I don't want the same thing to happen here. Uh, this is this is something that you know, and I understand when when the when the soccer team is playing and all of this stuff, and it can be off and on. But I think the city needs to, especially with this. And right now, it's not a nothing is a done deal until we actually sign and and hit the gavel and go forward. But we need to make sure that that doesn't continue to happen to the city. We need the revenue that we can for the city, every dollar that we can to make sure we take care of the people and the taxpayers that live here so it will not be riding on our backs. It's the same thing as I said earlier, is to make sure that this, this project has a guarantor and also with the, with the parking lots that is there, because parking is a lot of money. We see it. You know, parking lots downtown is about $50, $50 to park, especially at the Bridgestone building. I understand. Uh, this is something that we need to make sure of, and do not, we do not need to let this just slide by. Do not let the parking, because this is a big, big, big issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you. I'm just going to ask the questions, and they can be they can be sent to me. Um, so Please. I just had a couple of questions. I wanted to know: Is are these in any zones, like opportunity zones, promise zones? Is this in there, and that, that can be? Or maybe you can answer that real quick. I, I I don't know off the top of my head, but I will take a look, and Please. I'll get you that answer. Uh, it is in the promise it's zone, but not an opportunity zone. zone. Uh, I don't believe it's in an opportunity zone, okay. uh, but I will confirm that and let you know on both. Okay, good deal. And then I wanted to know um, how much are the apartments going to go for? And then I wanted to see how will the DBE um, be implemented? Who's going to oversee that to make sure that we're meeting our goals and will we get monthly reports, just how that, how that looks? And then I have one more question, and then, like I said, that can just be sent to me. Um, um, and, and also I wanted to know what's the criteria for picking uh, the construction and who will be responsible for doing that? And, and where we stand with um, committing to hiring a responsible contractor as it relates to the sports authority's oversight for that. And those are my questions. I, I think most of those may be from Ms. Falknotson, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. And with that said, does anybody else have any other additional questions? No one? Are you sure, Mr. Glover? <laughs> Just checking. Chair Bedney, do you want to? Just uh, wanted to thank the chair for calling this meeting and uh, inviting us to have it uh, with all the different committees and to the public and the people that came here and the council members. And also, uh, second, uh, what everybody said here, that it is important to me personally to support this deal, that we have the community benefits agreement in place before the last vote. So, but thank you very much for sending this out. Thank you, Chair Benning. Chair Shulman? 
think I'm good. I, I appreciate everybody's time. Everybody hung with this. We've been at this for three hours and 10 minutes. It's probably time for us all to go home. Um, there were a series of documents, obviously, that we've talked about that we need to make sure that we get. And uh, I think if you can make sure you get that or the administration can get it to the council office, that would be great. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Wilshire, do you have any closing statements or Mr. Coover? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on Vice Chairman Shulman's comment and request that um, finance um, work with Moody's and our rating agencies to see if there's a preliminary opinion that is available about the potential downgrading of our credit rating due to the issuance of these bonds that we would all feel better having that reassurance rather than worse if we were downgraded fairly shortly after committing to issue these bonds. Thank you. And that the August 27th meeting would be an appropriate time to report back on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilshire, Ms. Spar, Mr. Ingram, and your entire group here, finance. Thank you to all three of the committees for enduring this for three hours and 11 minutes. We are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.